six o'clock, I'll call the meeting to order the, uh, for the March 24th Finance Committee meeting. Before we start, I have to read this from the governor, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, General Law, Chapter 30A, Subsection 18, the and the governor's March 15th, 2020 order concerning the imposition of strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. Meetings in the town of Oxford will be conducted via remote participation to the greatest extent possible. We will strive to provide access to such meetings via a link to call in or other similar option. In the event we are unable to accommodate the same, despite best efforts, we will post recorded sessions of the meeting as soon as possible following the same. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequate access to proceedings. So call for a roll. Mr. Ewell? Present. Mr. B Present. Ms. Mazeka? Present. Ms. O'Neill? Yes, or present. Ms. Casey? Ms. Casey is not on yet. Oh, she's, her icon's there, but she's not. I think. No, All she's right. Not, she's not on yet. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nash, uh, our interim superintendent of schools. She's going to do a PowerPoint presentation on the school budget. Excuse okay. me, John. Yes. Shouldn't we? Oh, I got through the minutes. I'm sorry. Yes. Have, have we all seen the minutes of the meeting of the uh, meeting of March 16th? Yeah. It was a very short meeting before we joined the selectmen. <laughs> I move we accept this printed. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. Roll call. Mr. Ewell. Yes. Mr. Bacon? Yes. Ms. Mazeka? Yes. Ms. O'Neill? Yes. It was such a short meeting, I forgot. It's like <laughs> three minutes. All right, Dr. Nash. Yes. Thank you. Um, good evening, and thank you for inviting us this evening to give you an overview of our FY22 budget. So, if I could uh, ask you to look at page two of your presentation, uh, you'll see that. We'll wait till it comes up. This evening, we'll uh, quickly go through all of this, and certainly, uh, if you have any questions along the way or questions at the end, please obviously feel free to ask them. Uh, we'll go over the district's mission and strategic objectives, our budget planning process, particularly as it relates to the school committee directive early in the fall, as to the types of budget they wanted us to build. Uh, review quickly our district and building staffing, uh, something that is new this year. Uh, is the additional COVID-19 positions that were added uh, for us to be able to operate our school district since uh, last October in a hybrid model. I will give you a picture of our enrollment, a little bit of the history of enrollment, what's happening, and currently our building utilization uh, as far as our room use. Talk about our special education budget, our enrollment, our cost. Also, so that you know what budget assumptions we made as we were building this budget and also the unknowns that still lie out there, we'll review those with you. We'll also present this evening uh, the additional needs requests that came forward to the school committee as part of the two types of budgets that we built for them this year and those positions um, that we were able to incorporate into our FY22 budget and those that remain unfunded. We'll talk a little bit about our federal and state COVID-19 funding, uh, our budget request figure, and the pie chart that is very familiar to most of you with respect to how our budget is distributed as far as the cost. Five-year budget history. I want to review the capital request, particularly since we've had um, some issues that have come forward. I wanted to make you aware of that. Also, uh, probably uh, very important down the road, uh, is to update you on where we are with MSBA and Oxford Middle School, and then to finish up and talk about the impact that COVID has had on education. So with that said, I'm not going to read you the mission statement. It remains unchanged uh, since 2019. I'm sure that whoever sits in the seat as the permanent superintendent down the road will begin to review this. But again, I would point out that um, our goal in public education is to educate all students. And certainly uh, the three components of education for students besides academic are social, emotional. Uh, no more uh, than this year have we seen 
the impact and probably will continue to see the impact of uh, academic learning loss, unfinished learning, as well as the social emotional challenges that many students have faced, particularly if they have not been physically in our building uh, since last March. The next slide, please, Tim. These are the five major areas of focus um, that were part of the strategic plan that was developed in 2019 that the school committee approved. Focus on curriculum instruction and assessment. You will hear me talk about a position this evening that we've been fortunate that we should have had in this district, in my opinion, a number of years, but we have not. We've been able to add that position. Uh, parent and community engagement has been a focal point for us this year in the community, uh, particularly given the fact that so many of our students about 28% of our students have remained remote this year. So the connections that our staff have had to make throughout the year and continue to do um, have been extraordinary. Uh, if you were to talk with people in other districts, I think you would hear them say extremely positive things about the hybrid model that our staff and our, both our professional staff and support staff um, have had in place since October 5th. So that goes to our professional culture. Uh, with great thanks to all those who have led the district, as well as those who are in the trenches every single day. Management and operations, and of course, social, emotional, and physical well-being of students and staff. And I would suspect that uh, we will see uh, a great impact in those areas, particularly as we uh, bring students back. In the fall, in October, the school committee uh, gave me two directives, or gave us uh, two directives in building our budget. They wanted us to build a level services budget. Uh, first and foremost, uh, that is a budget that basically says, when you open your doors next year, you will continue with all of the programs, with all of the services uh, that you need to offer to students. There will be no reductions in staff other than in areas where you have reorganized uh, and to provide services better or where you don't need a program anymore. So we built a level services budget and we also built what we have called an additional needs or educationally sound budget. That particular budget includes additional staff as well as programs and or services. So we're gonna show you both of those this evening, but we'll focus certainly on the level services budget. But we also wanted to show you um, how we've been able to uh, reorganize and incorporate some of the needs that we say create an educationally sound budget. Next slide. This is our staffing. Uh, I wanted to show you our staffing uh, broken out by departments, starting with central office, our business office, our special education and student services office. You'll see at the very bottom um, that through reorganization, we eliminated two positions um, that were district-wide positions um, so that those positions uh, no longer exist uh, in FY22. Uh, one was due to retirement, the other was really due to uh, no longer needing it. And that allowed us to use those funds um, to help fund a position that was, is critical to this district and that's a curriculum directed position. Next slide. Our technology department, you can imagine uh, the use of technology in this school district, uh, given the fact that a year ago in March, uh, the governor closed all schools in the state. We are extremely fortunate that we were able to provide one-to-one -one capabilities. So every single student, grades K through 12, has a Chromebook. And in doing that, obviously, when you're providing 1,300 plus 1,400 Chromebooks, you need to make sure that you have the support staff. We did not have the support staff. We had 1.5 support staff before we added somewhere mid-year an additional technology assistant. Uh, that was added through uh, funding that we have received through the federal government uh, this year to help assist districts in putting in place the necessary personnel and programs and staff that they would need uh, to make it through, of course, the pandemic. The same thing with our custodians. One of the areas that the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education uh, asked us to focus on as a mitigation strategy was additional cleaning, better maintenance of our buildings, particularly high touch areas. You can't do that with the bodies that we had prior to COVID. So we were fortunate again to be able to have 
monies from the federal government to add uh, four people that brought us up to 10 FTEs, 10 full-time equivalent uh, positions. Uh, those again are individuals who work part-time for us, but give, gave us that additional uh, body to continue to take care of the health and safety in our buildings with respect to cleaning, additional cleaning that we had to do. And again, we'll continue with those positions next year. Uh, the future is unknown with respect to what school is gonna look like as we reopen the spring. And certainly it's unknown when it comes to next year. Uh, that is it on this page. Those are our two new areas that we added due to COVID. Can I have the next slide, please? This is our staffing by buildings. Uh, again, this shows the uh, administrative staff, our professional staff, or really our, our teachers, those who del deliver direct services to students in one capacity or the other, our nurses, our instructional aides, all of our instructional aides in this district are special education instructional aides. So they are either wed to individual students, groups of students, or with a particular um, class of students or a substantially separate program. Our clerical staff at buildings and then our custodial staff, as you will see, if you look still at each of our buildings from a custodial lens, you'll see that we're, we're certainly still probably understaffed a little bit at the high school and the middle school, which are our two largest buildings. Next slide. These are the positions that we were able to add this year that we, were necessary for us to add in order for us to safely uh, open our buildings last October. Uh, I am happy to report that we have had no transmission of COVID within our school district. Uh, we have had uh, no student to student transmission within our school district. We have had no teacher to student or adult to student transmission or student to adult transmission uh, in our district. Uh, we have followed all of the mitigation strategies, uh, put that in place. And to do that, we really had to hire additional staff. Unlike some school districts, we did not come back to the town. We did not ask for additional funding. We were pretty frugal in utilizing the federal money wisely, I think. And that has helped us really keep our schools open, I believe. It has helped us uh, educate our students. So here are all the positions that we added this year. Three elementary remote learning teachers. We had approximately 28% of our population uh, turn to remote when we offered the, them the ability to either be remote or hybrid. So that's a large number. That's a little over 400 of your staff. Uh, at our elementary schools, we were a little over 100 and we needed to add remote teachers. We currently have a, a remote teacher at grades K-1 and we have two at grades two, three, and four. We added a long-term substitute teacher. Uh, we actually would have added four if we could. The difficulty this year was trying to hire any sub to come in. And I can tell you that the building administrators have had to be extremely creative. Our staff had to be extremely creative uh, in uh, meeting the educational needs of students. Um, thank goodness uh, many of our staff continued to work remotely if they were quarantined uh, and uh, our our administrators uh, act as teachers, uh, I can tell you, many days. We created uh, four positions, one in each building for academic assistance, which we needed, and that partly came to fill the void when we couldn't find substitute teachers. Uh, a big piece of keeping our schools safe and healthy and ensuring that our students followed mitigation strategies uh, like hand washing and sanitizing and physical distancing and all of that and keeping masks on was because we hired 15 health and safety monitors. They do everything from, uh, could be wiping down a desk at one building because we serve lunch in classrooms to escorting young students to the restrooms to make sure that we don't have more than in a restroom than we need. Uh, to being in the halls to ensure that when we have passing time, transition time in halls, that students stay minimum three feet uh, apart. We initially started the year with 10 monitors for our buses. Uh, those were um, contracted through Durham. We, as I indicated to you, hired four part-time custodians and we added a technology assistant. 
if you add all that up, it's a lot of money. Uh, it's a lot of money that we had to spend. And, and that doesn't does not even include um, additional desks and chairs and tables and PPE equipment and all of that to keep our schools safe, to keep them healthy and to keep them open. So those are all positions that we added uh, in many instances, one year positions. But again, we don't know. As you know, we indicated to you that our technology assistant and four part-time custodians have been incorporated into our FY22 budget and will continue next year as there is a need at this point in time. Next slide. So here's what our three-year enrollment looks like in each of our buildings. Um, this is an abnormal year. If one was to ever tell me a year ago, March, uh, we would be talking about closing schools down for the rest of that year. Uh, I would have thought you were crazy. We typically tend to see a decline of somewhere between 40 to 50 students on average per year. This year, you'll see that in 20, 21, we lost 122 students. But I wanted to point out of that, that we had an extremely small kindergarten class, 64. We typically run somewhere in the low hundreds. And part of it was due to the fact that parents don't have to send their child to kindergarten. They took a year off, uh, they homeschooled, they decided to wait. Also, it just was, our number was low to begin with. It was one of those years. The other place that we saw a great increase was in homeschooling. We typically run in the low 20s, 18 to 22. We had 52 students this year homeschool. That's gonna change. So that number, this number of a loss of 122 is not typical. It should be somewhere around, I would say, in keeping with the past years, 40 uh, to 50 students that you tend to lose, and particularly as they leave uh, grade eight, they tend to exit. <clears throat> Next slide. I wanted to show you what our building utilization looked like. Obviously, when you're adding additional teachers this year, remote teachers, they have to have a place to teach. So we really have used almost all of our available space in our buildings. Uh, we have eight uh, classrooms or eight rooms that are available right now. All of the others are currently being used. So uh, as you look at this, some, some of these will open up at the end of this year. However, uh, we are looking at uh, addressing the needs of students, both their academic needs as well as their social emotional. And I would envision that next year we're going to be uh, reducing class size and recommending to our school committee that we keep some of these positions because we know that so many of our students are gonna come back with either unfinished learning because we know our teachers have told us they just couldn't get to everything. They probably won't get to all of the uh, rich content that they need to cover. And we also know that we're gonna have learning gaps for students. So we're gonna utilize, I think, all of the space. We may even be utilizing more space at the, at the middle school than the five rooms we have there. So uh, we've had to this year move our Barton, two of our Barton teachers um, to Chafee, two of our remote teachers, because Barton is completely full. There is no space at Barton. Uh, and in fact, next year we're running an additional sub-separate program because our students are aging out and moving to our Barton school. And as a result of that, we've, we've had to look for space uh, because it, we just don't have it. So that's the one issue that you continue to have. While you may have dwindling um, numbers down the road, uh, we still have a space crunch in some of our schools and Barton being one of them. Why is that? Numbers of students. Numbers of class size? Yeah. Is yeah. it uh, the, remote, uh, the fact that uh, the COVID you've got, you're limited yeah. with? It just, you, you don't have that many um, classrooms, surprisingly, uh, as you might think. Uh, the building isn't that large. Uh, we've had to um, use two rooms uh, for uh, additional space for a sub-separate. We'll use two next year. We have one right now. Some of those classrooms were built and they're exceptionally large. They're actually oversized classrooms. I don't know what they initially were built for, but they're larger. And then you have some that are very small. They're actually less than 850 square feet when we were measuring. We also have some that are over 1,000 or 1,200 square feet. So I don't know the rhyme or reason to why it was built, but I can tell you that this year when we hired additional remote teachers, we had to move them to Chafee where they had space. Yeah. So. Well, some of them were built just for kindergarten. Yes. Well, your school, those two schools were originally K-4 schools. Right. So when you moved to this model, you all of a sudden took 
if you have bubble classes in grades two, three, and four, they're not all in one yes. building. Before you could redistrict and say, I've got two K-4 schools and I could have 200 here and 100 here. Now you can't do that. Every kid who's in grades two through four goes to Barton. So when the redistricting happened, I don't know that anyone really thought about the impact because you only have so many rooms you can use. So this could be rectified if we went back to- If you reorganized, reorganized. if you look at reorganization, yes. yes. Okay. Because then you simply have a smaller K-4 school or whatever, K-5 right. or whatever, and a larger. Right. Yeah. The problem that you have in doing that is trying to keep equity. Yeah. That's, the, that's the issue that you typically have when you have neighborhood schools. Uh, next slide, please, Tim. So uh, I want to focus a little bit on special education. Uh, you certainly are aware um, our job is to educate every child who walks through our, our door. Um, we're pretty consistent uh, in uh, keeping, uh, trying to create programs in district. We currently run seven sub-separate programs. And when you can keep a child in-house, you do two things. One, you are able to monitor the type of service that you provide. It certainly is, in most instances, more cost-effective. And you don't put a child on a bus for an hour or so to go to a particular um, out of district um, uh, school. Right. Now you can't always do that because we can't run every single program that a child needs. And there are some uh, programs that it just doesn't make sense from a financial aspect to run. But when you have enough of a cohort, uh, it behooves the school district in my opinion to try to create that program. We have very few students out of district the problem is in most school districts, um, the out of district tuition is extremely high. As, and that out of district tuition you know, is made up of private school settings as well as collaboratives. We tend to find that collaboratives, um, while they offer programs, they're a little bit less expensive. But remember, when we talk about cost, we're talking about transportation as well as tuition. So it's not atypical in some districts to see an average cost somewhere between 70 and $100,000, including uh, transportation, and on the other hand, you can see a cost as high as a quarter of a million dollars uh, for a particular student. So the more you can create in-district programs, and we have 38 students right now in in-district programs that we run in our school district, the better off, in my opinion, you are. We have 265 students this year who are uh, on IEPs, who are special ed students. That represents about 18, a little over 18 percent of our population. You can see in the prior two years, uh, our population of students was a little less in FY19 and about the same in FY20. But then again, it's based on your total enrollment. So therefore, you're going to see some variation. Next slide. So what makes up the cost of special education? There are three um, chief factors in the cost of special education. First and foremost, of course, are salaries. If there are programs, whether they're students in sub-separate programs or students in inclusion programs, then your special education educators and all of the costs associated with offering um, occupational therapy, speech and language, uh, physical therapy are all incorporated into that. So salaries are number one. Out of district tuitions is your second highest cost and your third cost is usually transportation. So I broke out two of those so that you could see comparison over three years of what the costs look like in SPED for those two areas. Our transportation costs, uh, pretty consistent, went down a little bit, uh, we anticipate for next year. Uh, as you know, we have a uh, multiple year contract with Vanpool who provides uh, transportation. Uh, we no longer do our own special ed transportation. We get out of the bus business, which was a wise decision. <laughs> Uh, it was part of what I had brought forward when I was here the first time around, and I would continue to tell you it's the best decision we made probably in a long time. And our other district tuition costs remained relatively uh, stable. Uh, again, we had 26 students uh, in 2000 uh, FY20. Uh, we have anticipate 22 students next year. Again, the cost of that is based on where a student is placed, uh, whether they're uh, day students, whether they are full residential students, but we do a very good job uh, in this district of providing SPED services to all of our students. Uh, so next slide. 
So here's what it looks like though. I think it's important to recognize that almost, this is fixed cost for us. In education, um, we have to educate all kids. That's what we should be doing. But if you look to see the total cost of our budgets and what our budget was in FY 2020, 21 and 22, which is the figure at the very top, the 18 million. And you look at the total cost of SPED, which includes all of those areas I talked about prior slide, you can see that SPED takes approximately 36% of our budget. So in any school district, you know, those are in essence fixed costs to a degree. Those are costs that you certainly have some control over, but not all control that you would in other areas. And there are areas that we cannot cut in some instances if an IEP says that the student receives these services, and they include an instructional aid as a one-on-one, -on -one, then we are obligated to do that. But I also wanted to show you what happens if you don't have circuit breaker and our SPED federal grants to offset that. What's in red is the amount of money that, that a school district gets, in this case, Oxford, every year to offset their special education budget. Circuit breaker is a direct offset uh, again, uh, unlike some school districts, we do not balance our budget on the anticipated circuit breaker. We are a year behind. So we know when we say to you, this is the figure for circuit breaker for FY22, that's actually FY21 circuit breaker figure. We're not balancing our budget in anticipation of circuit breaker. And I think that's a, an excellent way to uh, plan for spending your budget. Don't spend in anticipation of, spend the money you have. And that's what we do here. Uh, next slide. So we've had to, to make some assumptions when we built this budget uh, early on, starting to build it in the fall, meetings with all of our administrative team to determine what they identify as needs, meeting with our school committee members in December so that they could have the presentations from all of the administrators and finally get to a point where uh, we were comfortable that we had a level services budget that included all of the known costs. So what are the known costs? First of all, the budget is as good as March. At this point in time through March, this budget figure that you have today and the budget handout reflects what we know. It is not a budget that goes back to December or goes back to November. It is as current as March as far as costs go. But those costs, as you know, can change. Uh, we have accounted for all the increases that are in our collective bargaining agreements. These are negotiated contracts um, that uh, were made with the unions that uh, are listed below. Uh, we, as we have assumed uh, the budget offsets will remain stable, and those offsets include circuit breaker. We know what our circuit breaker figure is. We have looked at our entitlement grants, which would be our federal grants. And the one that the big one for us is the SPED entitlement grant. And we underestimate that by about 5%. Uh, we have taken into account food services. The food services department in that area has been bolstered this year by the fact that the federal government has continued its program of free lunch for all. And so our reimbursement on a monthly basis actually helps us. And so I think you're going to see that obviously if that doesn't, if that changes, then we could have some impact uh, in a less than a positive way in food services next year. And our preschool revolving account, those are some examples of the accounts that we have to make uh, some decisions about with respect to those remaining stable. We've also uh, projected a 3% increase in out of district tuitions. That seems to be pretty constant in what we're seeing. Next slide. The other assumptions uh, it includes merit-based increases for anyone who's on an individual contract. So that would be our administrators and anybody in central office. It accounts for all of the changes, the anticipated changes that we might have in out of district um, tuitions on students. So as of March 1st, uh, we meet often with the uh, assistant superintendent for student services and for SPED and student services to ensure that if she knows or has on, on the radar screen a student who might be going out, that we can make sure that we have incorporated that into our budget. It includes, as I indicated to you, and we'll go over in a few minutes, some of the FY22 personnel requests that have come up through our 
central office and or our principals. Uh, and we're able to do that through personnel reorganization and other budget changes. And it includes any new contract increase for regular uh, ed transportation. Our contract uh, ran out, runs out at the end of this year with Durham. Uh, we uh, have awarded that school committee, awarded that contract to first student, and we've incorporated the slight increase uh, in that already in our budget. Next slide. So there are lots of unknowns. <laughs> The biggest one being what's the impact of COVID going to be in our students and really on our staff. Uh, our big area is to look at and identify and we, we can't sit here and tell you we know what the cost will be uh, because we don't know until we get students back in and we probably won't really know that until we get halfway through next year. But we know that there is going to be academic uh, loss. There are gonna be gaps in students learning. And we also know that we're gonna be dealing with a lot of social and emotional issues. So. What are those costs? Well, I can't quantify them. I can talk about them in categories. Uh, we know that some costs are gonna to have to continue uh, around cleaning, uh, expenses around PPE. We do not know what guidelines will come out for next fall. We don't even know what, what school's gonna look like as we reopen in April. We know that we're gonna to need to address costs in personnel and programs related to academic learning gaps uh, as a result of COVID and bringing back our students. Uh, we know that there'll be costs to address the social and emotional needs of students also. Next slide. We know that we may have to train staff. We may introduce new programs and social emotional programs, new academic programs. We know we're gonna need to buy additional resources and train staff post uh, pandemic. We know that special education students, some of whom may be out, have been out since last March and maybe returning in uh, April or may not return until next September, that those students are really at risk and we have to programmatically look at them um, either through the end of this school year or at the very minimum uh, run programs in the summer for them. And then our big challenge is maintaining uh, safe, healthy facilities. And there's a cost to that. Uh, you know, it's not typical costs that you would use on a yearly basis, that's for sure, but there are costs. Uh, let me say one thing, though, about that, that I think is really important. I can tell you that uh, Justin and I have worked very closely with uh, individuals on the town side with respect to facilities. And uh, both Mr. Duvall and uh, Mike Lucas have been nothing but um, excellent to work with. Responsive, uh, whenever we want to need them to, to come in and answer a question, they are there. So it has been a fabulous relationship and I want people to know that. In many towns they talk about, you know, the collaboration and what happens if the towns are coming in and kind of working with the schools. This has been a wonderful, um, I think, benefit uh, since the two or three years ago that I was here. So I wanted people to recognize that. Uh, next slide, please. So, what were the requests? When I said to you earlier, the school committee asked us to build two types of budget. They asked us to build uh, a level services budget. And then they asked us to build, what are the real educational needs? What do you project? What does your team see as educational needs uh, in the future? Uh, this is our list. Some of them we've been able to uh, fund for next year because we have reorganized, eliminated positions, had some breakage in retirements, things like that that we've been able to pull from to create positions. So anything that you see an asterisk next to is already in our budget for next year. Uh, number one on this list is a curriculum director. Uh, there has always been a need uh, in this district to articulate curriculum and nothing in more than ever, I think um, this year we're gonna see that that's gonna be true. So that position is a position that we were able to incorporate by not filling a district-wide school psychologist position and because we had the retirement uh, that we did not fill in central office. The technology integration specialist, uh, we are, it's an unfunded position. I'll talk a little bit about it in a minute. The technology assistant, as you know, when you add uh, a one-to-one -one K-12 and you think that you're gonna fix uh, all the Chromebooks that go with 1.5 uh, people, you're not gonna do that. So we needed to add someone mid-year. We were able to do that and we're able to continue to do that because we're not gonna take away the one-to-one -one initiative. Our K students will still be using their Chromebooks. We are not gonna go back to the old model. K-12 
kids will continue to have their Chromebooks K-12 uh, with them. Our part-time custodians, we will continue to employ those and those are already in our budget. Uh, our mindfulness teacher uh, is, a, is a, uh, need to increase that. We're actually gonna be increasing that this year as we bring back our um, regular ed teachers uh, because we need uh, that to cover our specialist. Um, she's a specialist with art, music, computer, computers and uh, PE. And we need that because of the added uh, remote teachers at the elementary level. Uh, under the law, we had to increase our ELL teacher because we had incorporated more students. And as a result of that, um, the law requires a certain amount of time based on the level of the student. And because of that, we had to increase that mid-year to meet the minimum requirement of minutes, daily minutes for students who are ELL, English language learners. And then uh, our assistant principal work here at the high school, we were able to add some weeks to that. Um, the high school is your flagship. Um, it's, it's atypical that you don't have two full-time administrators or we weren't able to do that, but we were able to add a few more weeks so he can uh, pick that up. And certainly during the summer when the yeoman's work really happens uh, at a high school. And then our part-time athletic trainer where we had recommended to the school committee that we can take that out of the revolving account uh, for athletics and at least sustain that for a few years, that will be a contractual uh, employee. So those are the positions that are asterisk that we were able to incorporate through some reorg, retirement, things like that that happened, uh, vital positions, some of which we, we had to move to uh, if we wanted to keep our building safe and others um, that we certainly felt there was a strong need for. The next slide will show you what we, are not able to fund and how much that's worth. These are all the positions um, that you saw on the prior page. These are positions that were requested by our administrative team. Uh, these are positions that we believe are vital. Uh, I'll talk a little bit, little bit about some of them, uh, but they total $480,000 and we certainly um, know that that's an extraordinary large amount of money. Uh, we believe that some of these positions we can address at least temporarily through ESER 2 money, uh, particularly our elementary reading specialists. In fact, we're probably going to increase that to three positions. Right now, those are elementary, but we also think that we will need to have a position at the middle school. Uh, the classroom teacher at Barton, uh, we're going to recommend to the school committee uh, addressing reducing class size, at least for next year and be able to address that, we hope, uh, again, through our uh, ESER 2 money. And one of the big areas that we have a need for is foreign language at the middle school. It did exist uh, for a period of time. Uh, it is uh, considered to be uh, you know, a critical component of introducing students to a foreign language so that when they transition up to the high school, they either have completed level one at the middle school and they can then take advanced a level of foreign language uh, when they become a junior or a senior. Uh, again, we might be able to address that on a temporary basis in ESER uh, two money. What language? Uh, it's either Spanish or French. Generally now more districts are leaning towards Spanish. Not Chinese? Uh, no, because you can't find Chinese teachers. That's the difficult Mandarin. You can't find them. Uh, it was uh, one of those languages that a lot of districts, particularly some of the metro districts started to look to. Uh, but they found after a period of time, they couldn't get, the, uh, couldn't get a foreign language teacher, no matter what language it was. And that's the real difficulty, um, filling foreign language positions. One of the reasons why we have a high school foreign language teacher is the graduation requirement changed a number of years ago, about two or three years ago, I believe, uh, that now requires all students who graduate uh, from the high school to have at least two years of a foreign language. And they did not increase the uh, staffing to meet that. So we were uh, wondering that, that, you know, why that didn't happen, but it didn't happen. So next slide. Here's uh, just a brief summary of uh, the needs, why those positions that we have not funded, uh, the needs of, of those. Uh, again, uh, each of these being brought forward by either a building principal or a district administrator um, to advocate what they felt was important uh, for them when we started to build, um, build this budget back in the fall. One of the comments I would make about the technology integration specialist, our teachers have come such a long way 
from last March. I mean, we limped through like most school districts when the governor pulled the switch last March, we basically completed the year, but using technology, probably uh, getting by, uh, using it to the best of our ability. But if you could see uh, the, what teachers are doing now, and it's not just in Oxford, I'm sure it's across the state. Um, it's, it's leap years from where we were a year ago, March. To continue to provide support now that we're using it and not to go back is so critical. We've spent a lot of money in technology over the years in this, through this um, town, through grants that we received, and in other ways this year through our COVID money. It would be a shame um, to not try to get positions like this, to work with our staff, uh, to encourage them to continue to use it, to work one-on-one -on -one with different types of um, technologies that we have brought in or different applications that we have purchased um, that staff need to have some training in. So along with having a curriculum director and having these positions and having the resources and instructional uh, applications, you can move to the next level. So it's just uh, another just piece of the puzzle, if you will. So we, we love to- savings with remote learning, keep them a component of remote learning, whether it's advanced placement <laughs> courses or something, well, we to keep that. Uh, we can keep it through the end of the school year, but we cannot next year. The commissioner is very clear on that. Um, remote learning next year will not exist unless you have a medical um, issue and that will be on a case by case basis. I'm thinking of, uh, as a component of education as far as being able to take some of these advanced places. We do courses. have, we do have that currently at the high school. We yeah. do, and yes. Expand that, yes. And then you can yeah. take the-, the, the, the We run, um, we, have a, we have an app application called Edgenuity. Uh, for those particular electives that you can offer mm -hmm. or that conflict with a course that you already taken, mm -hmm. a student will do that. In fact, students this year who are remote take their five core content courses with live teachers and then they take use Edgenuity. But with that is a cost. It's a very expensive program. It's not cheap. Um, uh, and again, it needs to be in your budget on a yearly well, basis. Well, foreign language or something. I mean, I don't know. I'm just yeah. saying if you're, you're gonna, everybody's going to be connected yes and we're talking oh, yeah. about keeping them connected yep. there may be some leverage there yeah where yep. we can think out of the box and deliver some of these educational things remotely yes yep. and then re reassign some of the staff that would have to do it in class i mean it's not, that's, yeah. it's not a fit for everything right, right. no and then we will we will do that this year uh, and there certainly are times uh in the future uh, we have students that at the high school level um, leave and take college courses in that uh, or can take them online uh, so that will continue, but it's part of their school day and they're sure. in the school, but they're simply someplace else using using technology to do that. Yeah. Saves money for the parent. Yeah. Oh, sure. Tuition. tuition. And it absolutely yeah. does. Yeah. If you can do have a collaborative agreement with a, a local university or a two-year right. college, you already are earning and credits. We're going to be connected and the teachers, everybody's connected. That could be leveraged. Mm -hmm. be great. Absolutely. Next slide, please, Tim. So I wanted to present you a slide on um, the funding. Uh, I said to you that uh, we were able, we opened our doors October 5th. We opened to hybrid learning. Um, it is a four day a week, full in person. We serve lunch. Uh, Friday is a uh, remote day uh, for our students. They have live teaching, uh, synchronous teaching in the morning. And then in the afternoon, the teachers have time to prep. We have not wavered from that. We've not had to close down a grade, uh, a school, or obviously the district. And a lot of that is as a result of the fact that we were able to add positions, we were able to fund those positions. We did not come back to the town, um, as I said, as some districts have had to do, uh, because their funding may not have looked the same as the funding that we've received. So I wanted to quickly run uh, by the funding. So you can see that, that when they talked about how do we keep schools open, this was not cheap, I can tell you. Uh, right now, we're planning to reopen April 5th, and I'm probably up to $30,000, $40,000 in um, some desks and tables and a tent and things that I need so that we can safely open. So it's not cheap. It did not come without a cost. People don't realize that. We're the only ones that realize that because we've had to figure it out. So here are the monies um, that we've received thus far. Um, initially, there were, and this is all federal or state money. There's only one piece from the state, small piece. 
So the federal money started out as CARES money, and I'm sure the towns and cities got some variations of this to some degree. Uh, our factor, was, our amount was 364,000 and some change. Uh, that helped us in the fall to reopen. So that money is gone. That's the money we use to hire all those staff and to do all the other things and buy the PPE equipment and the acrylic, the barriers, the tables, everything that we needed to open, uh, to add extra staff that we needed to do everything just to be able to open in the fall. And then uh, the state stepped in this past February and said, we're gonna give you some money. Uh, they gave it to us in February, they gave it to us in two uh, doses, February and April, and it has to be spent by June. I was um, gracious of them. So we're using earmarking that money to use for our reopening for April. So we're trying, because we know there's an end date to that. So we wanna use that money up first because some of the COVID uh, money from ESER can carry over to a next school year. So I anticipate that money will be gone. We've had to bring back staff. Uh, when you decide to bring all students back, you have to add some staff, particularly around lunch and recess. So we had to add hours. Uh, so there are all kinds of things that are, are happening as principals are doing uh, the re-entry planning. And then we ended, we started with what we call ESER 1, for lack of a better word. It's listed as ESER. That amount came to us again, uh, most of that money is gone. I think we're probably down to 60 something thousand left in Easter one, Justin. Uh, yeah, close to that, it's earmarked for uh, staff salaries to the end of right. the year. Okay, so. So, so that continues to pay. So those first three columns basically are getting us through this year. So add that up and see how much money that is. So any, anyone who thinks that it didn't cost money to keep schools in session this year, um, better look closely at that, because if you didn't get it from the Fed, you were going to your towns to get that money. That's what it cost us. And if you look at the positions, um, we, we weren't extravagant in the positions. We put in health and safety monitors because we wanted to ensure we could keep our schools open. We wanted to ensure the health and safety of our students and our staff. We didn't want our staff to have to worry about doing certain things. We wanted them to focus on trying to teach when you've got kids in front of you and kids at home. The money that's not spent yet is the two columns to the right. ESER two money. That's the, and these two, most of the ESER money is based on the Title I formula. So it is a very a discriminatory formula. It's the only time where you, I suppose, would say that you were somewhat pleased that your number of Title I students is as high as it is. Uh, we are a Title I district, and as such, um, if you were to compare the numbers in other towns that are not, you'd see a huge difference. In fact, it's a sore point for some superintendents uh, in their conversations with the commissioner around uh, this money. But it is a formula that the, the federal government uses. And that ESER 2 money is definite. Uh, we haven't received it yet. But that's the money that we're going to earmark for next year to address the learning gaps. We have a plan that we'll be bringing forward to the school committee at their April 12th meeting. Uh, we have probably 13 positions that we're gonna be looking at um, to reduce class size, to look at the social emotional. We have programs, we have to incorporate summer programming for students. So there's a lot of areas um, that that will cover. So that's pretty much spoken for for next year. The money that we don't know yet, but we anticipate is coming. It, uh, it's the money that just came out of the ARP Act that um, the president pushed through. Uh, $1.8 billion went to the state of Massachusetts directly to DESE. 90% of that has to be redistributed to school districts. The same formula will be used. If you look at ESA 2 money and you multiply that times two, that's what we're probably gonna get. That would be money, and if you look at the, the end date, that you would push forward to the next school year. Or unless there are some needs that come forward, um, we can use it anytime, once it's available, but the end date um, is the following school year. So you're looking at FY22 for Easter 2, and in essence, FY23 for the op Easter money. However, it could be used sooner if you needed it. Could you use it for this 480,000 shortfall? On these additional we, we could, but you've got to be very careful because then you fall off the cliff yeah. at the end and those positions either have to go away and in some instances you don't want them to. So we've got to be strategic 
I think we've done that um, in our ESA 2 presentation um, to the school committee, but we'll see where the school committee falls on that, but you could, yes. Very similar to money that came out years ago called ERA money um, that allowed us, the federal government gave school districts that we could spend over a period of three years um, to do that. And this money has a very broad use, very broad uh, uses. Next slide. So here is our level services budget request, um, 18775975 you have that in the budget. Uh, we've had some uh, conversations obviously throughout the year uh, with the town manager, director of finance. Um, that represents a $609,000 increase over last year. Um, our budget last year, remember, uh, was about 500,000 more than that figure, but we reduced that. So we're really getting back to where we were last year. Uh, so that 609,000 is gonna be very welcome for us to have a level services budget and not to have to focus on reductions, but to focus on addressing the learning gaps that we know kids are gonna have. So, um, you know, that represents a 3.35% increase. On a next slide, please. This is our, the typical pie chart that you see every year to no surprise. Uh, most of our, our costs are fixed. Uh, we look at the four top areas, obviously salaries. We are service industry as towns are, 75% uh, roughly uh, of your budget, of a school department budget is in salaries. Uh, the rest of it, the next biggest um, expense is our sped out of district tuitions, which goes back to telling you that it is much easier. And of course, if you can create programs in your district and they can provide services for students, it's gonna be a little less costly. And then we have regular transportation and SPED. So when you add those four up, they're almost at 90%. So everything else is somewhat irrelevant in the sense that um, there's, not, we're, there's no place for a school to cut other than personnel when we have to reduce budgets. Next slide. This is a look over the last five years, um, shows the uh, actual appropriations that the town meetings appropriated during FY18 through 21, shows our request in FY22, but also it shows you the um, increase, what that increase has looked like, averages around 3%, a little over 3%. Of course, this last year, uh, as all departments did in town, reduced a budget. So that's why you have that anomaly of a 0.55. It averages out if you, uh, to about 2.64. If you were to take out the 0.55, obviously it would be higher. Typically a school district needs four to 5% yearly to have level services budgets. Uh, so, but it gives you a big picture there. Uh, what this does not include, as you know, is the indirect costs um, that, that the town pays. Um, so those are not incorporated into that. Foundation enrollment figures are gonna be different than your general uh, uh, enrollment figures because they represent preschool, vocational school and other areas. So that's why those numbers look higher than uh, we typically we have as actual enrollment. Next slide. I wanna talk about the capital project requests and just a little bit uh, talk about one in particular. So the school committee prioritized their request and, and sent them as all departments do to the uh, town. Uh, the ones that are asterisk, I believe at this point appear to be ones that, uh, we, that will be moved forward. It's my understanding uh, to the town meeting. They represent about $280,000 in repair projects. And we're obviously extremely happy that the town is looking at these and uh, dealing with these. One of those in particular could come off, of course, um, should the middle school move forward. Uh, you could uh, gamble with whether or not you want to replace the boiler at the middle school. But again, um, you know, it is aging out and I think it's the only boiler that has not yet been replaced, if I remember correctly. Oh. There's two that need to be replaced okay. there. So this, this, yeah. I, I believe this would cover one of them. So, um, so it, again, uh, you know, if, if you were to get a project, the uh, problem is you're probably looking at three, four or five years by the time a building or whatever you would get uh, would be open. So you, you could very well be that you would need to spend that money. The, the area though I'd like to talk about a little bit is the um, very expensive uh, repair of the siding for Barton and Chafee. Um, 
it is a, going to be a very expensive project, but it's something that you're going to have to undertake. Um, if you know anything about the siding, I had the luxury of walking over there after the panel fell off. This is a piece of the stucco that they put on top of the paneling. You can see what it looks like. This is what's falling off the buildings, the two elementary schools. Uh, it is not the entire material, but uh, a number of, a few years back, we brought in an engineer who uh, I think it was the former facilities maintenance director, Dick Donne, who brought in an, an engineer to look at it. And his report indicates that the paling was not installed correctly. Um, it was not supposed to be this cement stucco like fiberboard. It was supposed to be uh, metal, I believe. Uh, they probably uh, ran out of money when they were doing these projects, my hunches, uh, and reinstalled this. It maybe would have succeeded if um, they had not installed it incorrectly. Unfortunately, uh, you've probably long outlived um, any kind of recourse. And uh, the water damage, the water is seeping through because it was caulked incorrectly. Uh, the horizontal joints have eroded, the caulking has shrunk and water is getting in. So if, even if you were to turn those buildings back, you know, unless you sold them, the buildings need to be repaired. This is a significant cost, but it's, it's one that honestly, um, in my opinion, needs to be seriously looked at. I don't think it, it's going to remain the way we want it to remain and you could have more water leakage in the buildings in the future. I think it's probably gonna to have to be seriously investigated. I think the 400,000 is probably a low figure. I think it's, it is probably gonna be higher than that. And it is at both of the schools. So when they were both uh, renovated, they used the same product, did the same thing. And so you can see that same damage at both schools. This panel came off of Chafee School. So, and actually I noted it three years ago when I was here doing my summer building tour that that water damage and I believe it's the same panel that fell so uh, so anyway um, that's a serious uh, gonna be a serious cost and it's but I think it's one that um, obviously uh, we need to the town needs to think about you know and, and needs to really examine uh, next slide please I wanted to update you on Austin Middle School and MSBA uh, I believe a little over a year ago, uh, the school department submitted four SOIs uh, for each of the schools. Uh, when you submit to uh, MSBA, while well, you can submit as many SOIs for as many buildings as you want, you have to select one and identify one as the chief building um, that you go to the top of the list. Uh, they selected, uh, we selected uh, the middle school. And... Uh, in March of 2020, that SOI was submitted and it was um, prioritized as, as of the four, the building that needed um, to be looked at. In November of last year, this past November, uh, we had a virtual meeting uh, with MSBA, uh, the town manager, finance director, other people were involved, Justin, uh, had a conversation uh, with um, them about the project, about just in general, just kind of a meeting that they set up with us um, after the submission. And in January, they notified um, us that the middle school was one of 30 schools in the state selected to move forward to what they call the core program. That was uh, a few months back. And then around February, March, we, uh, we were asked to do a virtual tour for them, uh, for the middle school. Typically they would come out and do that tour. Uh, obviously we did it virtual. Um, Tim was gracious to go in and film all the areas. They asked particularly to look at certain parts of the building. So the first category are areas that they asked to look at. The entryway, the corridor, the classrooms, science rooms, cafeteria, gym, boiler, floor coverings. Those were areas that MSBA requested. We added other areas like our bathrooms because we know we have some bathrooms that are not ADA compliant, wiring and uh, library space. So Tim did a wonderful virtual tour 
we sent that off. Sometime in April, next month, we will receive a notification as to whether we are invited to move into what they call the eligibility period. Um, you will have up to 270 days to complete a series of um, prerequisites, uh, one of which is to uh, make sure that you have some type of financial community support. You would have to form a school building committee. Uh, you would go through a series of about six different uh, categories of prerequisites. And if you are able to do that within the 270 days, then you would move to what they call uh, a feasibility study. Now, so that people don't get too excited about it, uh, we don't get to determine ahead of time what we need. The feasibility study does that. And that's when you would look at enrollment projections. You would look at you know, needs, educational planning, for example. Do we want to think beyond a middle school? Do we want to think of an L middle school? Is this the time to do that? You would have those discussions. Um, they would have those discussions with you. And uh, so that's exciting. Uh, we don't know yet. We'll know in April and we'll see. We will not be able to, however, tell them, MSBA, what we need. Now, it doesn't work that way. Uh, they come in and, and they certainly do that assessment. They work with you. They look at all the projections. They look at your educational planning. You probably will, will have a school building committee you, or you will have a school building committee formed. You will have hired probably an educational planner to take the district through the reorganization piece with your superintendent. And you may come up with something and they may or may not agree with you. You may say, we'd like to have a brand new K-8 building. And they would say, great or not great. Sorry, we're not gonna pay for that. We think you could renovate this building and keep it a middle school. So that's the unfortunate part about that because they're spending taxpayers' money, our money. And uh, they, you can't just say, well, I wanna have this. You can say that, but you would be paying at 100% and they would not be funding you uh, that amount uh, of that reimbursement. But I think it's exciting. Uh, and uh, I think uh, whoever is sitting in this chair, um, if April comes and we find out, it's going to be uh, kind of a fun ride for them over the next 270 days or so to see. Uh, but it, it requires a strong collaboration with the town, with your town manager, your boards, you want to make sure that everybody is on the same page. You want to make sure that they're, you know, that you are working as a united effort from the district side and from the town side, because MSBA doesn't want a project to fail. It doesn't want it to go forward and fail uh, when you have to go to a vote, because that doesn't bode well for anybody. So um, starting early and, and uh, involving you know, the people that need to be involved, I think is going to be a critical piece for whoever is uh, sitting in this chair. Next slide. So COVID, uh, COVID changed our lives and education. There's no question about it. Uh, a year ago in March, right before I was hired, I was sitting on a beach in Florida, just about ready to fly back home. And uh, then I ended up uh, coming to the district and we were talking about the potential of closing schools, some of the superintendents. And before we could even make that decision, the governor closed. Um, Education was turned upside down. I've been in education for over 50 years. Uh, I never thought I would ever see this day when we would do this. Uh, I am so proud of what has gone on this year. The educators from, from the, our teachers in front of students to our principals, to our support staff, I can't tell you from my perspective how they have made my life a heck of a lot easier than many superintendents. They have been flexible. I have never worked with a union president who has not put the priorities of her people forward, but the priorities of the district and our students along with staff. It has been a really a, a phenomenal experience, one that I never thought I would ever, ever in my life as a superintendent have to go through. Our teachers um, flipped the switch uh, and have become um, extremely, even more capable than I thought they probably ever thought they would be in teaching, have had to been as innovative, as creative. We've had technology support that you could never believe. A technology director who, in the blink of an eye, went into every single classroom and set up teachers so that they could teach the way they needed to teach. Uh, 
it was a team. When I say it was a team effort, I know it sounds corny, but it, it was a team effort from day one, from day one. So uh, I can't tell you how blessed as a superintendent having to go through this, I feel as I begin to look back at this year. So I would say, as I start to kind of wind down, let's not revert back to old things, old traditions, old ways. We've learned so much about what we've been able to do, how we can learn differently, how we can do things differently. We've collaborated with people that we probably never thought we would collaborate with. I know my nurse, my head nurse, better than I ever want to. As blessed as I am to have her. I know more about pool testing and Abbott Binex now testing and everything else that I ever thought I would ever know. So we've all learned. And to me, what happens next year is gonna be the next part of the story in education. Tim, next slide. So I'll end with this. Uh, old Socrates. Uh, the secret of change is to focus all of your energy, not on simply fighting the old, but in building the new. And I think you know, the positive of, of this, if that one could look at it from an educational point of view, is that we adapted, we became innovative, we were able to change, and learning continued. And that is a tribute to all of the employees uh, of Oxford Public Schools. Uh, again, I, I would say this is not about a small, this is not just about a small group of administrators. This is about everyone who went ahead and did their job. And uh, if you were to have conversations with anyone around in other school districts, um, they will tell you we're, we're we don't get complaints. And so we're gonna take April 5th when all of our elementary students come back and April 28th, and we're gonna to continue to ensure that our families feel connected, our staff have what they need to finish this year on a very positive note, as positive as we can be given, uh, given what has happened uh, in this country. So uh, I'll end it on that and any questions we'll answer to the best of our ability. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Somebody once told me without change, we would have butterflies. Oh, that's a great. <laughs> <laughs> that is a great expression. So I open it up to the committee. Any questions or comments that you would have liked to make uh, support Dr. Nash? Don, this is Joan. I have a few questions. Um, when I was looking over the draft budget that we received, um, there's a few things that I, I have to I have questions on. First of all, there was a and there is a program called ACE. I believe it's being eliminated this year, but what is it? So ACE was a program. Uh, actually, ACE is the outgrowth of what used to be coffee. So um, ACE, ACE is a program that is really one of our seven substantially separate programs at the high school. Most of the students in that, programs, in that program are on IEPs, and they are students who have social emotional needs. So it's not an alternative high school, but it is a substantially separate program. Uh, we were able to really look at that and last, and that's part of the other piece we looked at in the, in the uh, early fall, and uh, substantially reduce uh, the way that the program was designed and the staff. So there was another savings that I didn't even realize that happened last August or September, yes. Okay, so the elimination of that program. We didn't eliminate the program. Oh. We changed, yeah, the program is still runs. Uh, it does not have the same staffing. The premise behind the program oh. is different. It was considered to be more of what I call a hands-on program where students had voc a vocational component. It's not anymore. And therefore we were able to eliminate the three vocational teachers that were part of that. But ACE program is still a program um, that runs at the high school. Okay, so the $121,000 that, um, was that incorporated into other areas of the budget? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. Um, and well, then- we about, go ahead, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I, I, that's the end of it. I, I don't have any other questions on that. But I was also looking both at the middle school and the high school, the other student activities accounts. And I was wondering, the, the programs that are in those accounts, were they, um, oh, since last March, 
were they all sustained? Uh, you know, there was like yearbook and, and I forget what the others are, but given the different environment that we were in, were those, um, were those programs all still available? And if not, um, again, was the money that was appropriated used? So there, there are two components, I think, to this. One of the stipends right. that are paid to individuals who, uh, who, and that's contractually as part of the, uh, part of the OEA contract. Uh, last year, uh, when we, uh, from March to June, when we were shut down, I met with the OEA president. We reviewed all of those stipends to determine whether or not the individual who was uh, the uh, activity person involved or the head of it or the advisor to the program, whether that they could continue to do that remotely. In some instances, they were able to, in others, they weren't. So we prorated the stipends based on that. The accounts themselves are different than what I'm just talking about, though. Justin may be able to comment on that. Uh, yeah, so those are primarily made uh, made up of stipends. It's really just the stipends for teachers um, to, to work in these after school activities and various programs. Um, for this year, uh, some of them may not have been filled. Um, and it, go back to what Dr. Nash said for last year, uh, many of them were prorated. Um, however, this year, um, some of them may, may not have been filled. I'd, I'd honestly have to, to look to see where we are for this year. Um, I, I realize I'm not really answering your question. So um, what is happening with that? We have not met with the school committee to, to repurpose those funds or do anything with that. So at this point in time, um, if they're available, we still have to have that discussion with the school committee. Okay, and athletics would be in the same ballpark too, wouldn't well, it? Yeah, yes, yes, except athletics, um, you know, obviously we're running athletics. We're in our fall two season. We'll be getting our, our spring season on the a week later than typical. So as far as those go, any coaching positions um, that are part of fall two, we ran some uh, in fall one and we will be running uh, baseball, softball and track. So all of those will be fully funded positions are obviously our athletic director too. Uh, so some of those are going to be funded. It's, you know, obviously it is impacted by whether or not um, we can uh, run the sport. Okay. And then finally, I noticed that um, under the circuit breaker that the uh, private and in-state tuition was down almost $500,000. Um, That's I guess, what does the circuit breaker do? And uh, is that a, a, a uh, some monies that we get from the outside or just what is it? Circuit breaker is extraordinary cost. We file, um, our um, assistant superintendent and her uh, support staff will file and it's for extraordinary costs beyond a certain amount. Uh, it used to be 42,000, it may have crept up to 44,000. So you file. Uh, for students where the cost to educate that student is above and beyond that. And you get a percentage of that back. Uh, wow. Circuit breaker came into effect to help school districts because all of us years ago were, were concerned about the rising cost of special education and the impact that it had on your entire operating budget. So the state, so two former superintendents uh, wrote the circuit breaker law and it continues to be in effect. And it, it, it comes as a result of cost above and beyond. The good and bad of, of it is that you have to be above a certain number, which isn't terrific, uh, but you, you do recoup that money. And that money can be used to offset special education. It can't be used in your operating budget in any other way. You use it to offset your cost in, in special education. Uh, as we indicated, or I indicated earlier in the presentation, that's used to offset. So we're always a year behind. Some school districts anticipate what they're going to get and use it to balance their next year's budget. We are not. So the numbers that we use or Justin uses are real numbers. We've already received that money and we roll it forward um, to the next year's budget. Um, if you didn't have that, you could see where, you, where the significant cost of SPED is. So you could see what, what impact that would have along with your IDEA money too. Uh, you know, sometimes you're looking at well over a million dollars to help offset. It was over two million for 22 years. Yeah. It was well, over two million. Yeah, that was our total cost offset, out of district, right. but our offsets this is an offset for special ed. 
Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, Dr. Nash? Committee members? This I presentation was excellent. Thank you. Oh, sorry, Karina. No, go ahead. I was going to say the same thing. No. It was a great presentation. <laughs> it was very yeah, informative. It was very, yeah. I like wrote things down and was like, no, everything was answered. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. I, just, I just had one quick question, which was um, I was reading a report recently about, uh, you know, some of the dearth of uh, programming for advanced uh, edu or advanced learners mm -hmm. in the public schools. And mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there is, um, if that's something that's been addressed or that's in the minds of the, you know, the committee while you're looking at these uh, budgetary considerations at this moment, or if it's just completely well, out of the mind right now because of the current state. The, um, we continue to run, I, I can't tell you the exact number. I think we're well over a dozen advanced placement programs. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's one of the challenges you have at a secondary level, our high school, as you know, is um, not a large high school. And oftentimes when you are, you, it is, program and course driven at a high school as opposed to um, seat driven at an elementary school where you simply say, I have 100 students and I can put 20 in a class and have five teachers. You can't do that to run a comprehensive high school. And as such, if you want people to come to your district, you have to run advanced placement courses and programs. And so actually, I, I think uh, Mr. Nugent has looked at, um, at adding more in the future. Um, one of the reasons why he wants uh, a foreign language teacher is so that he can then run. If we can run a foreign language program that starts at the middle school, then a student leaves the middle school having completed level one, and they can get to an advanced uh, placement course by the time they're a junior or senior. So you actually, this is the, the double edge, the connection that you have you know, between middle and high school. Uh, so no, we're not, we're not reducing any programs at the high school or any advanced programs, no. And that's where tele-learning could come in. You can. Work. We absolutely, we absolutely. To expand yeah. cost-effectively with yeah. tele-learning. Yeah. You can absolutely add um, seats um, through programs like Edgenuity, where students can take uh, advanced placement classes, particularly if they conflict uh, with other advanced placement courses, uh, which oftentimes happens, mm -hmm. uh, that we find that students are taking, you know, three or four or five advanced placement classes, and we're only offering them at certain periods. So when you have some of these other platforms, uh, virtual high school is one of them, uh, you can do that and take those courses. And uh, so it's great. And they learn more than just the course. They learn self- Well, self-discipline. Self-discipline. Yeah, you so have to. So when they do go to college, yeah, they know they do. have to right. attend They're, that lecture as opposed yeah. to sleep in. Yes, you so. do have to. And it's one of, the, one of the negatives sometimes for some students is that when you're self-directed, you think you can keep pushing it down the road and right. do it later, and then you, all of a sudden it catches up to you. But rather than having a teacher teach that, if mm -hmm. you have a monitor yeah. to make sure yeah. that they are. We generally have a teacher who might be assigned. So while the teacher is not directly instructing, right. you still may give up a class period for that teacher to be the direct link to those students. So you're st it's still costing you, you know, for that period when you could have had that teacher in the classroom physically with 20 kids. So. Yeah. So there's some savings and there's, there's a there's a trade-off. Sure. Yeah, there, you're there right. There's some savings there, right. and, yeah. and you're opening it up, right? Where you can yeah. offer more courses. I think it's particularly helpful when you cannot offer that course, or there's a conflict, and you want to ensure that your high um, range learners don't leave and go somewhere else. You want to make sure you can continue to offer these, and particularly if you have five or six students, sometimes it, it, it you just can't. Offer. It's going to be interesting in the next couple of years how we can leverage a lot of this stuff, save yeah, costs, and, exactly. offer and broaden the programs yeah. without incurring yeah. major costs. Yeah. There's going to be some costs, but obviously. Yeah. Okay. Well, I, I think it's important to recognize, too, when you look at uh, the, the money that, that school districts have had to use. I mean, we forget that. And I even forgot it until I made this, this list and put it all together and started looking at it to say, you know, it cost us a, a bundle of money keep our schools open this year, but yet we wouldn't have done it any differently, but thank goodness we had that opportunity and we had the funds to do that. I mean, I'd like yeah. to see the schools have an extended day. I mean, to me, there's not enough hours in the day, but, mm -hmm. you know, especially mm -hmm. with some of the services you have to provide. Right, yeah. Uh, you may see you may see some interesting things come forward from the commissioner, though all of them will have to be negotiated with unions. Sure. Um, but that certainly could be one of them uh, to address learning gaps. One of the things the commissioner has thrown out already is to get your staff to come back a week early and do what they call accelerated learning. Well, it's easier said than done. 
and there's a cost to that. So, um, anyway. All right. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Appreciate your time. Mr. Chairman, it's it's Jen Kelly, the town manager. Before the superintendent actually uh, leaves to to allow the next two presenters, I do just want to say because this is our last budget to present uh, in tandem. <laughs> I hope. As a town manager, um, I want to say uh, a, a great deal of thanks uh, to both her and to Justin for working very cooperatively with myself and our finance director here um, at the town hall. It's uh, going to miss our uh, late night uh, conversations every time we've had a, a change in policy plans uh, this past year in particular, but we certainly have adopted a, a very collaborative model, which we want to continue with the school um, district and with the incoming uh, superintendent, but um, I want to say thank you to you, uh, Christine. Uh, it's been a almost a, a, the perfect storm that you walked into uh, with with COVID, and we've all felt that. But uh, we certainly couldn't have done it without your leadership, and I greatly appreciate that uh, from the financial perspective of of trying to to hold the fort down and uh, put forward the priorities of the district going um, this coming year. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, allowing me that. Uh, ability to comment here in front of the finance committee because it is very important and anybody that knows the history has understood um, we haven't always had that collaborative relationship um, not while I was not here and Christine wasn't here so I, I greatly appreciate that thank you thank you Dr. Nash you're welcome thank, thank you very much Dr. thank you hopefully we won't be back again <laughs> my car won't there's, take my car won't years. take it <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna my car is just about out, out of miles and, and tires, I think. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Thanks. Justin, thank you. Thank you for all the answering all my questions offline. Certainly. Anytime. That. Anytime. Yeah. Didn't have to ask any because you've already answered. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks again. Everybody. All right. Next up is Jim Kelly, the town manager. Presenting. Looks like Kyle, Kyle Brenner, Kyle, and, and yeah, Dave um, Iacobucci. Yeah. Did I, did I say that right? the screen come up. Kyle, are you there? I think it's, yes, it's, yes, nice we're here. Sorry, it was just a little tough hearing it. Um, so yes, this is Kyle Browner, Superintendent Director at PayPath Regional Vocational, and I have our business manager, Dean Ikebuchi, here as well. You said it wrong. You're kind of covered with, uh, I don't know, okay, there we go. Is that a little better? Sorry. Right, that's the way this is. We're sharing our camera. Can you hear us okay? I can hear you fine. Okay, great. All right. So, uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair and Madam Manager and committee members. Uh, as I said, I'm Kyle Brenner. I'm the new superintendent director at Bay Path Regional Vocational. And uh, I thank you for letting us present this budget tonight. This budget was developed based on the assumption that the school will resume 100% in-person learning and that many of the health and safety protocols and measures we put in place will remain in place to mitigate the viral transmission. Additionally, the budget will maintain the core values of providing our students with a high quality academic and technical education. This proposal continues our efforts to address not only our students' academic and technical needs, but also their social and emotional well-being. We are committed to our missions as well as maintaining our fiscal responsibilities to our member towns, especially during these difficult financial times. I will now turn over the presentation. Um, I can, if you allow me to share the screen, I can put the PowerPoint up. Yes, please. Okay. There it is, yeah. Okay, so you can see that. All right, I'll turn it over to Mr. Ikebuchi now. Thank you, Kyle, and good evening, everybody. Thank you again for having us back. 
Uh, I have to admit, Dr. Madison is a pretty tough act to follow. It's probably been one of the best budget presentations I've seen in a long time. Uh, I'm going to try to go through this somewhat quickly because I am uh, trying to respect your time and I know you're running late and you have a lot of other things on your agenda. So if at any point in time I've glossed over something that you want to hear more about, please stop me. Uh, I'll be happy to backtrack if necessary. By the same token, uh, if I need to be prodded to move along a little, certainly feel free to do that as well. Going on to slide number two. Uh, to take away from this slide is that our Chapter 70 funding has increased by $327,020, and our Chapter 71, which is regional school transportation, has decreased by $309,051 over the current year. As you, I'm sure you know, these numbers are all based on the governor's budget. And that will more than likely change as the state moves through its budget process. Uh, with any luck, uh, we'll have a budget sooner than December of 2021. Uh, but clearly, I don't think uh, any of us is expecting a budget any sooner than June or July. On slide number three, if you look at the lower right hand corner, you can see that our required net school spending has increased by $1,215,935. That's funded by an increase in the Chapter 70 funding and also by the minimum local contributions that our 10 towns collectively give us as the minimum. And that amount has increased by $888,915. So our required net school spending for fiscal year 22, at least based on the governor's budget, is $21,398,161. Slide number four, uh, we want to remind everybody that our member town assessments, at least as the budget stands now, are at the minimum that is required by law. We are not requesting funds above minimum. Our member assessments, will total $11,745,288. And that budget also includes our debt service assessment of $1,564,103 for the borrowing on our building project. Page number five, uh, we say this as often as we can because oftentimes uh, we'll get questions by staff locally, you know, why are we only asking for minimum from our town? And although we're at minimum, it's important to remember that those minimum local contribution levels have increased collectively by $888,915. So even though you're at minimum, our 10 towns are giving us nearly $900,000 more as a function of the required net school spending developed by the state. On a bright note, uh, we established a uh, regional transportation reimbursement fund last year in June. We put any surplus appropriation, I'm sorry, I keep saying it. We put any surplus revenue that we receive for school transportation into that fund. And then it becomes a funding source for the upcoming fiscal year. So we believe this year, we will receive $300,000 in excess revenue that at the end of this year, we will transfer into the Regional Transportation Reimbursement Fund and use it to fund transportation costs next year, which results in a direct reduction in the, in the assessments for the town for transportation. The, the dean, is that the, the state giving us less money, 309,000 less? That you had to transfer the money because when you transferred, you left seven thousand for balance out of the three hundred seven right. in, in the account. So you're going to be yeah. the account this year to offset the state decrease, and then hopefully next year you'll re receive will come back in to do the same thing the following year. No, uh, the money that we're transferring at the end of this year is a direct result of a decrease in expenditures. Uh, not a result in surplus or excess uh, revenue. 
So because we have that much less in expenditures, it creates a surplus in revenue. And we'll be transferring those funds into the reimbursement fund. Well, that'll offset the decrease though for transportation to the state tables. It kind of nullifies the 309 efficiency from the state's chapter 70. But I, I would expect that our chapter 71 funding uh, will increase as the budget travels through the state uh, process. Look at that. I'm quite, yeah, because when I look at receipts, that account, it had 307,000. If you're taking 300 out, that leaves seven. Kind of depletes it. John, I'm sorry, but I'm 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 having difficulty hearing you. I'm getting every other word you're saying. Okay. What I said was the in the and the receipts are in the receipts account, the special revenue account. This account had 307,000 and if you're transferring set 300 out, that would leave the account at the end of the process, unless new receipts are coming in, seven thousand dollar balance. No, if you're looking at the transportation reimbursement fund. Yes, that's, that's what I'm looking at. That's four hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars in it now, which are surplus revenues that we received in fiscal year twenty. Those funds were transferred into the reimbursement fund and are being used entirely this year to offset the cost of transportation. So at the end of this fiscal year, that fund will have no dollars left in it. Okay. The surplus. Revenue that we believe we're going to get this year as a result of the expenses, well, it are, is in the year of about three hundred thousand dollars. So at the end of this year, we will transfer that three hundred thousand dollars in receipt to become a funding source for next year. Yeah, Jan July first, two thousand and twenty. That four hundred twenty-five. You had expenditures through twelve thirty-one twenty of one hundred seventeen thousand. That left three hundred seven, and you're talking about taking three hundred out. And that's where that's where I was coming from. That's on the on the uh, special revenue funds re, uh, recapitulation account, and that's the transportation side of it or that account. Yeah, I'm gonna give me a second to look at that. Start with four and a quarter, 425,000. Right, those are the funds that we transferred in in June. Right. And you spent 117 to date through uh, December 31st, 20. And Correct. you left the balance of 307. Right. You're yeah. going to take 300,000. The balance in that account now, John, John is yeah. there when, although the expenses were listed from July 1st through December 31st, those expenses actually only represented a portion, and quite frankly, a very small portion of what the transportation expenses were for the first quarter of the year. We had a we had gone through some negotiation with our busing company about the way they were billing us this year because our transportation needs varied greatly from what was in the original transportation contract. So we were negotiating or renegotiating how the payment and how the billing would be made. And it wasn't corrected until December, at which time then we received bills back to September for transportation. So that, that is a snapshot as of December 31st. But if you were to look or if I were to run an account balance for you now, you would see that the expenses that hit that count are $425,000. Okay. Does that make sense? I kind of follow it. Yeah, I'm just kind of concerned when I'm looking at these accounts, some of these some of these accounts. We'll get into the, the, some of the other ones that I have questions about, but that's the one I I, I saw that where you were talking about 300,000 and that was 307. Looks like it was going to be depleted. Yeah, no, the one the $117,000 that was charged to that account is a small fraction of the expense we actually incurred between September and December. Uh, a very large payment was made in January that went back to December for our entire uh, busing for that quarter. Okay. So this 300 that you're talking about now is coming out of what? 
That is coming out of this year's operation and uh, which creates a surplus in okay. revenue. So these transfers are not a transfer of appropriation. It's a transfer of surplus re uh, revenue. As you may recall, when the school committee has either a surplus in revenue or an additional appropriation in revenue from the state, we usually vote to return those funds to the town and you get a reduction in that current fiscal year's transportation assessment. This kind of streamlines it. Instead of going through that process, we simply transfer the funds into the transportation reimbursement fund, and then that becomes a direct offset to the transportation assessment to our 10 towns. Yeah. Okay, back on to slide six. Um, this is just showing, us, showing you where uh, our expenses are coming from. We are still paying a sewer betterment tie-in fee to the town of Charlton of $30,750. We are continuing to appropriate from our free cash $50,000 to continue funding our OPEB liability. And this year, as, some, as something new, is we have no idea uh, if there may be some unknown, unbudgeted expenses related to COVID. So we've asked the school committee to reserve $150,000 of our E&D funds to fund those expenses. This has no impact on the assessments to our 10 towns. It's just making $150,000 available to us if we need it. Our excess and deficiency works the very same way as your free cash does. We lose our ability to use it after June 30th of this year and we don't get the opportunity to appropriate from it until it's recertified. For us, our e &D will not be recertified until January or February of 2022. So without this kind of a mechanism as a safeguard, if we start experiencing some very large unbudgeted expenses in September and October, we have a, a source to fund those expenses. It's like a reserve account. I looked at your OPED account. You have five hundred and forty thousand. You're putting fifty in, and then I looked at some of the expenditures. It's almost like you pay as you go for retirement. Uh, it's it's, it's not it, the OPED covers. Uh, is is intended to cover retiree insurance expenses. Right, but if, on our most recent uh, liability uh, valuation, we have a sixteen point five million dollar liability or unfunded liability. We have not used any funds from the OPEB trust. We're just putting money in at this point, and we have a balance now of about $550,000. Right, right. We haven't used any, any of those funds. I saw that. It seems, compared to what your 16 million that you did potential, it seems low, I mean, but. It is, I mean, in, in some regards, we're addressing it, uh, it's just how much do you put in? You know, at some point, you know, it starts impacting your ability to fund education. So although we're addressing it slowly, we are addressing it. Yeah, I looked at your stabilization account too. It only got 357,000. That, that would flow to me too. Right. And, and again, we don't, we lack a lot of the uh, ability to raise funds, especially when our assessments or our budgets at minimum you know, we have two funding sources, what we get from the towns and state aid. And when right. we develop our budget at minimum, there's not a left. And in fact, they, there can't be anything left at the end of the year, or we haven't met net school spending requirements. Have you got any idea what you're going to get on for COVID related between federal government and state? And any? I don't know what's coming up. Uh, we are expecting to receive 400 plus thousand dollars in the next round of ESSA 2 funds. And I'll talk about that in a minute, but we have no idea what we're gonna be looking at in terms of ESSA 3. All okay. COVID related expenses to date have been spent on technology or uh, PPE. Okay. On page seven, on the slide seven, 
This shows you how our budget comes together. Our operational budget is funded by Chapter 70. We do receive a school choice assessment, which comes right off of our Chapter 70 of $197,697. Our town's 10 minimum contributions collectively total $9,827,933. You see the E&D transfer for the OPEB liability, and then you see the uh, COVID unbudgeted expenses that I put in of 150,000, making our total operational budget $21,400,464. Below that, you see our transportation budget, our estimated cost next year are $1,521,541. That amount is reduced by the Chapter 70 funding of $899,039. The reduction put in for the $300,000 coming out of the transportation reimbursement fund, leaving a total assessment to our 10 towns of $322,502. Debt service is uh, made up of principal and interest, totaling $1,564,103. Our capital assessment of $30,750 making our total budget for assessment purposes $24,516,858. And go back to debt service, 814,000 in interest and 750. What's left on the debt service and, and what's the interest rate? Have you guys thought about, I know the town here just recently borrowed 0.333%, less than 1%. On some of the borrowing. I'm just wondering. I know there's refinancing costs involved. That's why I don't know what, what the amount still due is, but now would be the time if, if it made any uh, to make sense to re redo this that debt at low interest rates. Because that's a lot of money in interest. It's obviously more than the principal of 750. The interest alone is another 814,000. Can you tell me a little bit about where we are on that? Sure. Uh, we took out 30 year notes. And, and staggered borrowings and three staggered borrowings. So the first time we borrowed, that will that debt issue will end three years earlier than this one. Uh, the interest rate on the three borrowings varies between about two and a half percent and three point nine percent. We've had several discussions with our financial advisor about refunding the debt or refinancing the debt, and at this point. Uh, we don't believe you, we get only one opportunity to do that, at least at this point in time, because of the way the debt structure. So we're quite frankly relying on our financial advisor from Unibank to let us know when it's time to pull the trigger. Oh, but you're having discussions to do that just that because. I oh yes, every quarter of each year we receive a report from our Unibank, which tells us uh, or which illustrates what current uh, projects and borrowings are going out at in terms of interest rates. So yeah, we're, we're looking at this four times a year with Unibank. Well, hopefully you're gonna be able to do something because I, I know rates, like I said, we were dumbfounded 0.333%, less than 1%. Yeah, that's, that's really good, uh, a really good rate. Um, there's a lot of things that are involved in the type of borrowing we did with state qualified bonds. You know, I'd be uh, not being truthful if I told you that I fully understand it. You know, this is why we use a financial advisor who deals with this fully uh, and understands the straight qualified bond, pro bond process. But yes, I'm quite sure, you know, I trust them uh, completely to have our best interests at heart. So we do, we do keep in constant contact with them. In fact, we just went through a pretty lengthy process in completing our public disclosure that we have to do annually. Uh, and we, we recently had conversations about that as recent as last month. Okay. So our total budget for assessment purposes totals $24,516,858. When we add back in school choice, our total budget is $24,714,555. Okay. 
just some quick highlights about what's in the budget. Uh, we have we continue to fund supplies and materials for not only our academic classes but our vocational shops. We've included funds for new textbooks and social studies and in veterinary science, which is a new program that we'll be starting in September. And we've also made a small reserve for any replacement, textbook replacements that we may need. We've included funds to purchase some equipment for advanced manufacturing and to begin purchasing equipment for the veterinary science program. We've included funds to add one full-time equivalent veterinary science teacher. Uh, and that's not building upon uh, existing staff. That is the first position uh, that we'll be funding. We've included funds to add one history teacher to address class sizes. We've included funds to restore a part-time vocational job site coordinator. And just to briefly explain that, we've, we had the vocational job site coordinator position last year. This position is part-time and it goes out to all of the job sites to not only check on the students, but to check on the jobs that the students are performing to make sure that they're uh, educationally appropriate and that it's not just you know, some form of cheap labor for employees. At any point in time, we have over 150 students in this job uh, program, but because of COVID and the fact that we are hybrid this year, we have considerably fewer students out on, uh, on job sites. The person who held this position resigned in June of last year uh, to take a position, a similar position elsewhere. So at that point, we chose not to fill this position. We reallocated the funding that we had to that, for that position to other needs and are now bringing that position back because as Superintendent Brenner said, we are planning on you know, being back full in person in the fall and our budget needs to reflect that. We've also included funds to provide wage increases for our union and non-union employees. We have uh, committed some small amount of funds to continue with online learning, learning if necessary. And it appears at this point it will be necessary because it looks like the state will allow people to still choose to be full remote. We also included funds to implement the Student Opportunity Act, which is an act that actually increases the amount of Chapter 70 funding we're getting. Uh, and then you have to meet the requirements of what that funding is for. That act was supposed to go into effect this year. However, uh, it was postponed until next year. So we've made a reserve uh, for those funds, of those funds to fund the activities related with it. We are, as, as you may recall, we've talked pretty extensively about insurance rates. Two years ago, we approached all of our, actually three years ago, we've approached all of our employee groups and negotiated with them to have a plan design change. That plan design change uh, caused our co-pays to increase and we introduced the deductible. And the offset to that and the promise that we made to employees is it would stabilize rates as opposed to seeing the you know, five, six, 10% increases that aren't uncommon. Uh, and we're happy to report that for the past two years, our rates were the same. And next year, our insurance rates are gonna decrease by 2%. So that's a, that's a positive note. On slide number 11, shows you how our freshman seats are being allocated next year. We are expecting to bring in 315 freshmen, of which Oxford owns 33%, I'm sorry, 33 of those seats. And you see the information for the other 10 towns as well. Going to spend a little bit of time talking about uh, enrollment and students and foundation enrollment. So at BayPath, I mean, I'm sure you're all aware that your assessment has gone up nearly 10 and a half percent. And I'm sure some are thinking, well, how can we be at minimum 
and have our assessment go up, you know, in excess of 10%. And you can see how that's a function of the foundation enrollment. If you look at your foundation enrollment for BayPath, we have five more students or 3.73%, which may not seem like a lot, but in a minute, you're gonna see how that shift uh, really affects the town based on the loss of students uh, on your public school side. Now moving to slide number 13, you can see that in your foundation enrollment for the town, you've lost 92 students. And at Bay Path, we've gained five. And how does that impact you? Moving on to slide 14, and I won't spend a ton of time on it, but these are numbers that the state developed. So I'm hoping that this will give you uh, an idea as to how these numbers impact you. First of all, the state calculates the required local contribution, and that's the amount that Oxford needs to fund at a minimum for education. And that's education for us, for the Oxford Public Schools. And if you had any students at an outside tuition school, like an agricultural school, that would be included in that as well. The state determines what your new preliminary required local contribution is by using the municipal revenue growth factor. You folks on the finance committee, I'm sure have heard that term and know that it impacts a lot of the funding that the town gets in. This is another example of how that minimum revenue growth factor impacts the town. The state takes the required contribution from this year and simply increases that amount by your municipal revenue growth factor. And that brings up or creates what your fiscal year 22 preliminary required local contribution is. And in Oxford's case, that becomes $11,371,047. The state also creates a foundation budget for each uh, town and district. Your foundation budget for Oxford is 18610887 and for Bay Path is $2,389,461. The important information that I want you to pull off of that is the information that you see showing the percentage. So for the percentage of the foundation budget that goes to the town of Oxford is 88.62%. And for Bay Path, that's 11.38%. Those percentages are how the required local contribution gets allocated. And that's shown on page 15. And, and this is something which has contributed heavily to the increase in your minimum local contribution. The town is required to fund $11,371,047. Because of the shift in population, Bay Path is getting a much larger piece of the pie. So even though you would still be required to pay the $11.3 million as a minimum required local contribution, a larger percentage of that is coming to Bay Path because of the shift in population. Uh, and, and quite frankly, because of the loss of the students in the Oxford Public Schools. Now, I'm hoping that this next slide will show some, uh, give you some indication on what's going on. This information comes from a report called School Attending Children Report that is uh, filed with the state. This includes or calculates all school age students residing in your town, regardless of whether they are in public school, private school, charter school, or being homeschooled. These are the total school age students, not only residing in Oxford, but residing in all of our 10 towns. And if you look over to the last two columns on the far right, you can see what's happening in Oxford. In a one-year swing from the from the count from school year 2021 to 2020, I'm sorry, 2020 to 2021, you've got a reduction of 138 school-age students. And if you compare that back to school year 2014-2015, you can see that you have a reduction of 428 students. That's 428 students. <laughs> 
students residing in Oxford. And when you think about how that impacts your educational funding, you know, you're talking about millions of dollars that are being lost, not because anybody's doing anything wrong, not because somebody's going out to school choice or to a tuition program. It's simply because you have that many fewer school-age students living in your town. And if you look at us as a total district uh, over that same period, we've lost 1,221 students. Uh, or instead of saying loss, I say we have 1,221 fewer students attending all of our schools. And that that's a trend that is heavily impacting the funding that comes into the district. Moving on to slide number 17, I've just given you a breakdown of not only your town's assessment, but all 10 towns. If you look at Oxford, which is about the middle of the page, the second column in has your minimum contribution to us of $1,293,820. As we illustrated earlier, that's a number created or calculated by the state. Moving across to uh, about the middle of the page, you see your transportation assessment of $36,023. And that's your share of the $322,502 that we're assessing. Again, continuing to the right, you see your share of our debt service of $162,980, your share of the capital improvement, that's the $30,750 sewer betterment tie-in fee to Charlton for a total assessment of $1,496,027. Slide 18 just shows a comparison of the different uh, portions of our budget and how they've changed for Oxford. And you can see that what's driving the increase in your assessment is the increase in minimum contribution. And that increase is largely due to a shift in the population. But you can see your minimum contribution went up $153,672 for a 13.48% increase. Your transportation debt service and capital improvement assessments have actually decreased. However, you're still, still your total assessment increased by $141,896, which represents a 10.48% increase. Now, before I move on, because this is some new information that I don't know how familiar you are with it, so I planned on taking a little bit of time to explain it. Did you have any questions on the information that we've already gone over? One question. Hey, um, I just have one quick, I just have one quick question about the, um, so you were talking about like, it, it rang kind of jogged my memory as you were talking about like the new veterinary program. So really quickly, and I think this is just out of curiosity, how did COVID affect like the actual vocational piece of students like academic experience in terms of like, I know it's like a week usually in the classroom and then a week at their vocation. Like how did, how did that affect um, just the way things were done? And also like, what were the financial ramifications of that? So through the chair, I can address um, the vocational academic. So we, fortunately we started in hybrid and we were able to maintain that through our practices and uh, protocols put in place from the beginning up until now. As you know, with uh, the announcement from the commissioner for full return, although he hasn't stated when high schools are due back, we've started that process with a reopening committee to address full in-person. So we're looking at an April timeframe to bring all students 100% back. Um, we all know, and uh, those in education know that in-person is the gold standard and that's what we strive for. There are some schools that brought students back in person just for the vocational and all academics were remote. We looked at that, but we also know that students struggle academically in the remote as well. So it was important for us. We Our hybrid was structured that students through the course of the year would have 50% of their in-person time in the vocational and 50% of their uh, in-person time in the academics as well. So this it's structured that we have two cohorts 
um, the two grade levels in the building at any one time, one grade in academics and one grade in shop. And then they're here for half the week. And then the next half, they go home, get remote, and the other two grade levels come in, one in academic and one in shop. So we were able to get them the hands-on that they needed. Ideally, we'd love 100%, but it was 50%. They got to feel the tools. We relegated a lot of the vocational remote learning to what we term related theory. So that's the book work. That's the electrical code. That's you know the uh, shop math and, and science that goes along with that. So it's a bit of a challenge, as Dr. Nash said, our teachers have been phenomenal in stepping up and embracing the technology and using that. And our vocational teachers embrace the challenge of how do I teach them the trades remotely on that as well. The impact we were, and Dean can talk to some of the, we've had CARES, we've had ESSA, we had ESSER funds, and, um, and we asked the towns in Oxford, who was one of them, for the, um, the CARES Act money. And we were able to fund most. We did appropriate some of our E&D from uh, at the beginning of the year for unaccounted for COVID expenses. We, we had to dip into that a little bit. I think it's a, about a hundred. All, all of the funds that we received from the towns through their uh, Municipal Care Act funds funded uh, technology. So all of, not all of our expenses, but uh, a big chunk of the expenses we had for uh, Chromebooks, we had to do some infrastructure improvement. Uh, all were funded with the monies that we received from the town. Awesome, perfect. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Dean, 1,200 is the max uh, educationally that they have to entertain any one year right now. 1,200 is, is are the number of seats available total. Yeah, that's uh, that's really pushing our limits. Uh, we've been fortunate, as you see the increase in our net school spending uh, this year is $1.2 million. Again, that's a function of an increase in foundation enrollment, but that's about our math. Uh, each shop is limited into how many students it can take for safety reasons. And quite frankly, we just don't have the space on the academic side for additional classrooms. So yes, the short answer is yes. That's about where we are. So we, capacity. so we we've increased our seats by five going into this year. So we're going to have 134. Correct. Right. Now I don't know if there's a waiting list or not by communities, and I don't know if there is one for Oxford. I'm just wondering if if a town uh, didn't need all their seats that they're they're granted on the formula, how is that reallocated, or is it reallocated? We, we, the other have, towns. we do have a waiting list, unfortunately. We wish we didn't. Uh, and that waiting list is created by students on a scale, we're not by our staff on a scale of how students uh, did during their interview process. So it's ranked. So if you don't use all of your seats, we will go to the list and take the first student that's on it and then work your way down to we're at capacity. Once you're, once you're assigned the number of seats you have, both Oxford didn't have uh, any students waiting or any students applying late, we would reallocate your seat. I believe, uh, unfortunately, there is a waiting list uh, for Oxford students. Uh, I just couldn't tell you what that number is. I haven't checked on it recently. What if some of the other communities, surrounding communities, decide not to use all their seats, then you'd revisit Oxford's waiting list, basically. Absolutely. Yes, okay. absolutely. So any town with additional seats, those seats are allocated to other member um, towns, municipalities. So mm -hmm. any open seat remains in the, our 10 town district. We don't take out of district students. Right. Okay. And, and you know, really to sum this up, if Oxford had 33 students apply, all 33 students would get in. The wait list does not even, the rank wait list does not come into play. Okay. Any other questions? Do you have a breakdown of your graduates 
each year of uh, where they're going, how many to four-year college, two-year college institutes or whatnot. We do. I don't have a breakdown uh, for Oxford right now, but we do break down. We track our students at graduation, how many are going um, into the military, onto higher education, or um, right into the world of work. And then we track those students one year after graduation to see if they're still enrolled in higher education in the military or are still actively employed. So we do have those numbers. Maybe you could provide them uh, to us so we can share them with them. Well, the Boston Globe recently did an article on that situation uh, with a feeling that too many of the Vogue schools are uh, selling them uh, to students in terms of them going to four-year colleges other than technical, other than uh, programs where they would use their ability. Right, so a lot of our students in, in the vocational programming have changed. So we have students and we provide them, we always say college and career ready, and we give them the keys. We don't direct them to what door to open up, but we give them the keys if they wanna go on to higher education, an electrical student, he learns electrical code, he earns hours towards an apprenticeship in uh, the electrical union, but they also, if they desire to go on and become an electrical engineer, they can use that knowledge and go on to a four-year school. And many of the national grid require advanced beyond high school certification at a, um, a technical school or one of the community colleges. They demand those, those credentials. A, a master certified ASC mechanic needs to go on to a uh, technical school to get further education to get those certificates um, on that. So the students have the capabilities to go on to higher education if they so choose, or they can go right out into the world of work. We do capture, unfortunately, the way we capture it is one of those three categories for success, military, uh, career, or higher education. What we don't capture is the students that are using the skills that they learned here to pay for their higher education because we know that's quite a hurdle to get over. Um, anecdotally, we know a lot of students use those skills and go on to school, work during the day, and go on at night for that. Um, but we do provide them when we've got trades such as um, allied health, dental assisting, those required for the career ladder to move up. So many of our students go out as CNAs, go to school at night, become LPNs, become registered nurses, and move on for that. And our dental assistants are doing the same thing to become dental techs and then move on to um, higher education as well. But I can certainly get those numbers and, and provide those off the top of my head. I don't know those right now, but. Well, thank you. That'd be great. You could get those numbers. For me. Absolutely. Any other questions of the committee? All right, Dean, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Included in the governor's budget is something kind of unique, and that is the ability of town to take a portion of the ESSA two funds that are coming to the district and use it to offset the increases that they're seeing in their local contribution. The governor's house one chapter 70 proposals allow cities and towns experiencing increases in their minimum <laughs> local contributions to fund all or part of the increase using federal stimulus funds. If a regional school district's member municipality decides to exercise the provision, the district must reduce the member's minimum local contribution by its ESSER two share of the calculation of that member's assessment. Regional school district members can only use a share up to 75% of the total ESSER two fund. Member towns should understand that if this provision is included in the final budget, that using ESSA two funds to offset minimum local contribution increases represent a one-time relief, meaning if you use those funds to reduce your minimum local contribution, when the state calculates your MLC for fiscal year 23, it will be as if that reduction didn't take place. So what does all this mean? If we move to slide 20, 
I hope to uh, simplify this somewhat. If you look under the column that's entitled Southern Worcester County Regional, you can see what our SR2 allocation is. That's 44, I'm sorry, $447,033. 75% of that is $335,275, which is an amount that is available to allocate to our 10 towns. If you look about the middle of the page, you can see the town of Oxford. For fiscal year 2022, your town's minimum local contribution is $1,293,820. And we went over that, how that number was calculated earlier. Of the total amount that our towns are required to give us, that's the $9,827,933. Your required contribution of 1.2, nearly 1.3 million, represents 13.2% of the total, meaning of that $335,275 that we can allocate, you're entitled to 13.2% of that to fund an increase in your local contribution. So for the town of Oxford, that would be $44,138. You move to slide number 21. You can see what that will do to your minimum contribution, uh, just as, a, as for illustrative purposes. Right now, your minimum contribution has increased by $153,672, which is a 13.48% increase. If you continue looking at Oxford all the way to the right, by applying uh, these funds to lower your local contribution, you reduce that increase by 3.87% and have your adjusted uh, increase to be 9.61%. So it is a way to help fund the uh, increase that you're seeing in your local contribution requirement. On slide 22, I just put this in there so that you could see how this impacts your total assessment for next year. And you can see your 10.48% increase would actually be uh, brought down to 7.22%. Now, here's the, here's the dig on this. There's no way of knowing if this provision will be included in the final state budget. Because of this, the assessments that the school committee has adopted do not include the reduction of the town's minimum local contribution by its ESSER 2 share of the calculation. If we were, or if the school committee were to apply that reduction now, and the provision is not included in the final state budget, the eight towns who would have been eligible to receive a reduction would need to increase their funding to BACAP at special town meetings. Because we are at minimum, if we were to lower your assessment by this, and this gets cut out of the final state budget, you would be required to fund that additional money to BACAP. As you know, and as was done in December of 2020, the school committee typically returns excess funds that are received by the district after the adoption of the budget. The school committee has already been made aware that this provision of the law lies solely with the town and that they are fully committed to returning or lowering your increase by these amounts. I can tell you there's a pretty strong push from the educational people to have this provision of the governor's budget eliminated. The thought is, you know, that if we're given X amount of dollars in funding, we should be able to spend X amount of dollars and not give it back to communities. However, there's no way of knowing what's going to happen with this provision uh, other than to tell you it's not in the calculation now. And if it makes it through the final state budget, uh, the, uh, simply a vote of the selectmen uh, telling us to reduce your increase by your share of the amount is all that would be required uh, for it to take place. 
So that's SO2 uh, increases towards minimum local contribution in a nutshell. Do we have any questions on that? Think so. so we will be keeping an eye on that uh, and we'll certainly keep you informed as it progresses. This is one of the reasons why it would be kind of nice to get a state budget in a reasonable amount of time. But you know, we're all pretty much agreed that we'll be lucky to see a state budget in June. And even if we were to get a state budget in June, all of our towns would have already had town meeting by that day. So we're trying to make it easier on towns and on ourselves and trying to be a little conservative in that. Now, SR3, that formula would be the same thing going forward if there's money coming on SR3, just with the proof. There are funds uh, being identified now or being calculated now. We have no idea at this point what those funds will be uh, required to be spent on and how much it will be allocated to our district. It wouldn't be the same formula as SR2 or an allocation? I, I don't but, think, if, if you're asking for my opinion, I would be very surprised if there's a provision to uh, split the funds like the SR2 funds to, to fund some form of an increase for the town. I, I would be very surprised to see that happen again. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't happen. I would just be surprised to see it. This uh, this mechanism for funding increases in the minimum local contribution with SO2 funds is unprecedented. We've never seen uh, something where the state government will allow increases to the towns to be reduced with federal money. So it's not unique or it's very unique and I'm not sure it'll be uh, reproduced in future funding. But the answer three money, you will get, you'll get a proportion of that, not to reduce the uh, minimum contribution, but the formula would be the same as S or two, what each town would be contributing to you. How did that work? The, the, you got the 350 something thousand along the 10 pounds. S or three would be basically the formula that will arrive what portion would go to Bay Path would be the same formula as SR2? I don't know if that, you know, how they're going to allocate it. They're really not, not beyond the fact that the federal government is releasing, I, I what is it, 1.3 billion or something like that? I think to the state it was 1.9 with 1.6 going directly to the, you know, uh, district. Right. But we have no idea how that's going to be allocated. Right. I was just wondering if it's going to use the same foundation budget, the same, you know, same formula that you use for us or two. Probably, but I don't know. That was great, probably. Uh, but, you know, until they do, you know, announce what they're doing, we won't know. All right. uh, through the chair, I was. Through the chair, I was able to look up those numbers. So last year's seniors, we had 4% go to the military, 48% go to higher education, with 8% going to a two-year or technical school, and 40% going to a four-year school. We had 45% going to the world of work, and 3% unknown. Okay. So 40% went on to higher education uh 40% went to a four year school a total of 48% went to either went to higher education a technical school a two year college or a four year 48% that's good enough 45 the workforce basically 45 went to work and uh 4% are probably serving the US military and that workforce, they could be going, they could be working and then going to night school, like you were saying. You're not tracking that. They could. We don't track that. It's a it's a one or the other. So, but um just anecdotally from my previous experience in Worcester Technical High School and and here, a lot of students are are, are doing both. They're using their skills to help pay. Um a, a great story of is one student went into the world of work, electrical, 
went to school at night and graduated in four years uh, debt free. Debt free. Well, the, the day he was a person at night, he was taking electrical engineering cases or something like that. Yeah. Somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions of the committee? Dean? No. Well, thank you. Uh, I, well, I, 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 I'm glad to see that we've added veterinary, and uh, I also see we've uh, increased uh, dental. These are all locations that are going to, you know, looking forward, are all going to be <clears throat> positions that are going to be in demand. I did see textbooks went up a lot, and I'm wondering if, if those are, when I say textbooks, I, I, they're not, they're probably electronic. Text combination licensing, they're not the old traditional hardcover book, but no. I saw about something so included in that. But no, it is all online. Uh, it, it's amazing how these publishing companies don't have the expense of printing and distributing the book, yet the cost seems to go up and not down. Yeah, I because of the prior years that were there, all of a sudden it was, it was a shot in the dark, and I kind of attributed it to electronic in the fact that with COVID and everything, we're relying more on uh, computers and electronic learning. Yeah, and I've saw... never seen the electronic <laughs> textbooks. It's amazing. You know, they in, they embed uh, graphs, graphics, videos. So instead of just saying, you know, stating a fact, you can click a link and it'll give you. You know, videos of that, it's they really are amazing. It, it blows away the old hardcover book. I did say that you're also keeping uh, uh, video uh, learning. I think it was $160,000 that you had kept in there for uh, uh, tele-learning, if you will, for lack of a better description. And I, I, I guess you're going to move forward with a component of that where it makes sense, as far as, like you said, videos, I know. When I, I'm at home, I fix things. I'll look at YouTube and see how, how to fix something that might be broken that I'm not familiar with. Yeah. I, is there is that your thought process to, to uh it is. We did um we did keep that in there for those if the provision is available. The commissioner hasn't clearly said that it is going to be available for full remote next year, but we carried that forward in case that provision um is made for families that they can remain full remote so this year our cost was in that neighborhood of a, um 190,000 for the families that chose full remote rather than our hybrid i'm just wondering though when i when you talk about uh, learning the hundred thousand dollars in online teaching uh, besides being remote it, it could be used to offer other courses or other disciplines that are outside of uh, the actual four walls of the building where a student can learn something that, you know, like I was talking to Dr. Nash about the IP courses and that advanced placement. So that, that could be an opportunity where you could broaden your offering without incurring a lot of direct costs. Right. Absolutely, through a VHS, a virtual high school, uh, courses that we can offer during the school day here. We do have a partnership. Um, we offer advanced placement courses, a handful of those, and we have a uh, early college high school partnership with Quinn Sigmund Community College as well. But I, I know a lot of districts utilize the virtual high school to supplement coursework as well. Oh, good. So that, that those monies could be used for that as well. Right. Any other questions of the committee? If none, thank you, gentlemen, for your time and for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. All right, I think next on the list is Chief Sad. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. How are you? Good, thank you, Chief. And members of the committee, good to see you. Town officials, good to see you on board as well. Hello, Lauren. I'm glad your father let me use his chair tonight. Yeah, he said he was blowing it out. It's fine. I know he has a special day coming up on the 31st. Yeah, his 60th birthday. It's so wow. exciting. Yes, so, it is. Yeah, he's an old man. So let me start off first um, by just giving you a snapshot um, of your police department and how many personnel we have here. We have 22 full-time people currently. 
um, two part-time police officers. We have six full-time dispatchers and five part-time dispatchers. I have a full-time administrative assistant, uh, a part-time clerk. So if you do the math, that is 37 people that we currently staff here. We also have a fleet of 14 cruises that we have to maintain. So with that said, um, let me get into the budget. Um, I know it's in front of you. I don't have many slides. I just have one picture to share with you a little bit later on, which Tim is going to queue up for me as we move along through the presentation here. Um, but you all have the three-page budget outline in front of you. And I'm sure when you look at that, you notice that it's a 7% increase overall. 5.5% of that increase um, uh, goes to salaries and contractual obligations. Um, what this budget request does for us is it strengthens the foundation where the majority of the services are provided, namely along the patrol function and the dispatch function. Obviously one of the key components here being the dispatch function. So if I draw your attention to the first page of the budget outline that you have, and you look along that patrol line, you'll see it increases by $70,000, 70249 And the dispatch line, which is right below it, um, increases by 54000 That's the bulk of it right there. So what those numbers do is they adequately fund those positions where we're currently at. And, and like I said, it sets a good foundation moving forward. That six dispatch position for us really addresses uh, a comprehensive need. And that's putting a second person on the desk during critical times, the busy areas, the typical three to 11, um, you know, five to seven, when people are coming home from work, many accidents, people are coming home and um, seeing their family members. And we all see cruises flying through town all the time. We're, we're very, very busy. Well, that's, that's 22 officers and how many dispatchers do you think full and part? I'm sorry, Mr. Yule, I didn't hear you. You were muffled. What was the headcount on the patrolmen and dispatchers pulling? The, the patrolmen, um, we have 16 patrolmen currently. We have four sergeants, a lieutenant, and of course, myself. So the increase there actually covers officer number 16 adequately, which is full-time position number 22. Okay, got it. And the other increase that you're looking at, and, and the total increase um, is, is in the area of $180,000, which accounts for the 7%. The other um, increase is uh, a cruiser line where we're looking to um, re-implement the cruiser that we sacrificed earlier on in the year. Um, and that line has increased $45,000. Um, that gives us back uh, the second uh, car that we need. And of course, it's important to um, roll out the older cars with excess of 100,000 miles and keep the new ones fresh under the warranty um, for saving money in that regard. And Chiefs will have how many uh, cruisers on the road? Uh, we, we have uh, 14. Okay. And, and, and back to the statute, you mentioned part-time too, but I know you've increased that, like you said. So you have five full-time or? We have, we have six full-time dispatch. Yeah, and five part time, and we recently okay. hired two additional part time. We have, so uh, we we just increase it up to five. So with those numbers, it allows us to sustain any type of hit and provide the same level of service that really the community demands um, without skipping a beat. Um, and it prepares us uh, for the challenges that lie ahead in uh, fiscal year twenty two. And of course, every, every budget that's been presented to you, they've discussed the COVID issue and it's so prevalent. And uh, we have dealt with that considerably here too. Um, and because we we're fully staffed, we we're fortunate to be fully staffed during this uh, period of time, we were able to provide services without skipping a beat to uh, the townspeople. Um, even though we had four people directly affected by COVID and they were out of work and fortunately they recovered and uh, re returned to the job and we had two other staff members um, that had to quarantine because their family members were affected by COVID. Um, so with that said, I just need to recognize all the people that work here. Um, you know, from the beginning, they, they stayed on the front line like all of the uh, public safety and first responders did. And, and they all came to work in this uncertain time in this crazy situation. 
um, they answered the call and, and they didn't hesitate, uh, even in, the, in light of the uncertainty of this uh, pandemic that we're facing. So of course, over the course of the last year, we, we made adjustments um, that were made and uh, precautionary measures were put in place and um, we implemented them to the best of our ability. And I think we're, I think we're able to uh, uh, get through this fairly, uh, fairly well. Um, uh, we did take a hit, but we survived it. And um, a lot of it was because of the support really that, you know, the finance committee and town officials have given us in the past by allowing us to maintain that 21, 22 people full time. Uh, it, it's very important. So as we move ahead and, and we look at those challenges, of course, we talk about COVID. Um, another unknown cert uncertainty that we're facing coming uh, FY22 is the police reform bill that was recently passed. And I know that by watching the news, you've all heard about that. On December 31st, Governor Baker signed into law an act relative to justice, equity, and accountability in law enforcement in the Commonwealth. And essentially what that does, it creates a nine-member commission. Um, and this commission is going to be called POST, P-O-S-T, Police Peace Officer Standards and Training. So this commission is going to look at all police departments across the Commonwealth, including the state police. Um, it's going to be comprised of six civilians and three law enforcement personnel. Um, three of these appointees are going to be recommended by the Mass Commission Against Discrimination. Um, so we're not sure how this is going to go. Um, this commission post is going to be charged with certifying police officers. They're going to be charged with decertifying police officers in the case if an officer uh, gets involved in, in, in disciplinary matters that warrant it. They're also going to be in charge of the training component um, of police officers across the state. Um, so the consensus amongst all the mass chiefs in our meetings is that training costs here uh, are definitely going to rise. And of course, when I outlined the snapshot of our PD earlier, and I mentioned we have two part-time police officers. I don't know what the future of those two part-time police officers is going to look like because the discussion that is being had by um, the committees that are forming and the consensus of the Mass Chiefs is that these part-time officers are gonna have to be trained to the same level as full-time officers. So how do we get there? And they're talking about a bridge class of roughly 200 hours that these officers are going to have to have. 80 hours uh, will be comprised of online and then 120 actually um, classroom instruction, EVOC training, uh, that's driving a car or the hazardous situations and firearms. So all that translates into additional money and uh, we're, we're not sure. So. Uh, with that said, I just want to let you know that the department continues to explore additional sources of funding. So this year, we've secured $115,000 in grants to help defray some of these costs. Um, those are in the area of E911, uh, traffic safety. Uh, we received a grant of $18,000 this year. We got one $10,000 last year. That allows us to put additional patrols on the road in our uh, problem areas. And we also received a grant of $33,000 for a canine uh, program. And that's something new that we're going to implement this coming year. Um, and with that said, Tim, if you would put up the picture of our new canine and the police officer who's going to be training the dog. There we go. So oh. there is Zax. Z-A-X is his name. He's 18 months old. So he's still a puppy. Um, and that's Officer Ryan Kasich. He's going to be the handler. Now, the training involved in this pro, and this is brand new cruiser behind him. So he's a happy guy. He's got a brand new dog and he's got the cruiser and he's going away for training. He's going to be gone for 16 weeks out of the schedule, which I'm sure you can understand how that will impact us because while he's here, on shift, we don't need to replace if somebody calls out. Obviously, we're going to be short while he's gone away on his training. So that's going to be additional costs and overtime, et cetera, uh, providing those type of, of services. Um, so he'll do 16 weeks. He'll come back. And at some point, we have to send him away for another four weeks for narcotics training so he can um, 
you know, be trained to sniff out drugs and et cetera. But this first part of the training is going to be basic obedience training, uh, search related training, missing persons. Uh, so we're all excited here. So in effect, uh, that's our 23rd officer right there is Officer Zach's. So we're anxious to introduce him uh, to the community when he comes back after his training. I really hope to uh, aggressively put him out there in a uh, public relations uh, type uh, scenario. I want him to visit all the schools regularly. Um, I want him to make appearances at, uh, you know, different town functions as we move forward. So I think he's going to be uh, uh, pretty popular with everybody once we get this program uh, up and running. So also we anticipate um, receiving an additional $25,000 this year in grants. We're currently applying for it. And uh, I don't know if I mentioned this to you, Madam Manager, yet, but um, the office's bulletproof vests are expiring this year. They're, they're good for five years, which I can't believe we're at the five-year window already uh, because I wrote that grant as a lieutenant. And uh, so right now, Lieutenant Marcelonis is writing this grant. Um, I fully expect to receive it. And it, it's going to the vests are about $1,000 a piece to protect the offices. Um, so we should get that. And of course, uh, firearms licensing um, is another source of revenue, uh, a byproduct of what we do here, uh, which goes back to the town. Um, and licensing fees alone this year, we collected eleven thousand uh, dollars from March to March. I just did a fee report before I came on this evening, and uh, we process roughly four hundred and fifty eight licenses. So you can imagine uh, with the current political climate and things that are going on. Um, we're, we're getting many, many applications, a lot of new time applicants as well. Um, when you also look at the budget, one other thing I forgot to mention is when you look at service and supplies, um, that line actually went down by 10,400. But the overall increase um, that I'm requesting tonight is, is 180,000 and primarily to, to, to uh, cover the cost of that 16th officer and the six full-time dispatcher to adequately uh, cover those without encroaching upon other areas of the budget. So with that, I'll take any questions that you may have. Do you have any questions? Okay. You said. So you, you, you anticipate training with this new uh, law that's coming down. I, I, I think I mentioned to you before when, we were, when you were requesting tasers. Uh, obviously, uh, Firearm is the, the last resort for, of, of, of uh, offense from a, for a police officer. And uh, I, I supported the taser request and I, with that thought in mind. Where are you at at the time with body cams for the police officer? Have you given any thought to body cams, especially with this new enactment? So that, uh, so, well, and I believe that's going to be the topic of discussion um, with this post committee coming up. And uh, what I hope is it's typically what government does is they make, they require us to do things, but they don't pay for it. So I, I'm hoping that if they're going to make this a mandate statewide with body cams, and of course I am a strong advocate of it. I would, I would love to have body cams because our cruiser cams that we have right now um, help us 100% of the time. Um, I, I have total faith in my personnel and staff here that they always start off at the right level and they're doing the right thing inevitably it's the person that we're dealing with that makes it go bad. So I say all day long, put my officers on camera. I have no issues or problems about that. And I know the majority of these, these guys here support it. So I, I hope over the next year to two that we can get body cams on officers. And um, I, I think that's going to be one of the charges of the post commission as well, is to make sure that that happens. I think, I think it'd go a long way to protect the police officer more than. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and it, and it gets the full story, not half the story, right? right. Inevitably, with the videos you see online, it's when somebody comes after. We don't see the initial incident or event. We only see what happens at the end, and that's the person getting manhandled and putting cuffs. And you know, we didn't, we don't get to see the actions of the person prior to. So, it's a good thing. Can I ask a question? Um, I'm just wondering, what would you say in response to some of the comments around? Uh, appropriating funding for some of the services that are currently provided by the department to other, you know, committees or services across the town, thinking that something like responding to a mental health incident. Marina, you took the words right out of my mouth. Good question. 
So, Karina, could you give me that question one more time about mental health services? Yeah, sure. I'm just wondering about, you know, some of the comments that you hear that some of the funding or services might be better coming out of, you know, other services provided across the community. And as an example, an incident around, you know, mental health management where there's, uh, you know, a, a person who's requiring, you know, services for mental health case and whether that kind of a response from an officer um, would be required in that kind of an event or if those services and funding should be, you know, appropriated to another community service or function. Well, I, I think a lot of those proposals are unrealistic. Um, are there enough people to go around and service that particular need at two, three in the morning when a lot of these incidents are happening? Right now, as far as any mental health concerns, you know, we simply uh, transport to Harrington or UMass to their, uh, their mental health service. Would it be nice to have a luxury of a counselor on staff, somebody that we could call um, in, in some of these uh, particular incidents? Absolutely. I, I would love to have it. I, and again, this, this post commission may address that need because it seems to be front and center, but mm -hmm. are there the people out there who can, you know, adequately address the needs that we have at all times of the day? I guess that's what I'm saying. Yeah. I can see at two, two in the morning, she was a domestic dispute and a, and a counselor going on our, into that home. And usually that's where the, confrontation takes place. I would not want that job at two in the morning on our going into settle a domestic dispute, sending that type of person as opposed to a police officer. Yeah, right. They, they, you know, and you couldn't find a person to do that, to be quite honest with you. They're not, they're going to come in after the fact, once we get the scene secured and settled yeah. and safe. Um, I mean, that's what we do with our ambulance personnel too. I mean, we, we get these volatile calls, they post up you know, down the street until they get the clearance from us that it's safe to come in. Um, yeah. Any qu other questions that you've said, Karina? Yeah, I guess I just wonder about that because I, I would think that in some of these cases, you know, without appropriating the proper resources or funding and putting the budget into considerations like extra training or additional, you know, presence in the community can sometimes you know, also inflate that sense of risk or that sense of safety concern, which can escalate these types of situations. You know, coming from some of my past experience, you know, personally and professionally, I just, I wonder about that, um, that type of a response or reaction, you know, when the first presence that's seen is something that might be perceived as hostile, for example, or as defensive and people get into that reactionary mode. So I, it's just something to think about. And to your point around the commission, I think that's a good step in the right direction um, and addressing the needs of the community and the types of services that are required to ensure that they are coming from those appropriately trained and resourced uh, services. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Well, oh, Chief, well, thank you for your patience. You were the last on the list tonight. We ran a little long. I appreciate your, your waiting. You're welcome. So have a good night. I guess that's it. Thank you so much. I can see where the money's going. It's going to people, which is what it's all about. And I just want to thank the, uh, the manager and the uh, finance director for assisting me in preparing this budget as well. Okay. Thank you. Have a thank great you. night. You too. Thank you again. Thank you, Chief. Right. Uh, any old business before the committee? Business. Marina, you have something you want to say? Uh, no, I think I'm all set. I was able to ask all my questions today. I really do appreciate the time from the committee. Any new business? Next week we have on the agenda of DPW, town clerk, and Human resources, human resources and the town manager. And the town manager. Yep. Four. Okay. All right. Any committee requests? No. I think we got Roger, you got your information from Bay Path, so mm -hmm. that was good. All right. Do I hear a motion then to adjourn? So moved. Second. 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 Roll call. Mr. Yule? Yes. Mr. Bacon? Yes. 
Miss Mazeka. Miss Mazeka, you need to unmute yourself. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Miss O'Neill. Yes. Miss Casey. I used to be a mute. Miss Casey? Yes. Thank you. All right. Uh, you